Welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clara Lindstrom with CIIS Public Programs and Performances. Thank you for being here on this beautiful morning. I'm going to just briefly introduce the gentleman to my right, who it is my great honor to be hosting and one of the personal high points of the year for me. Um, he needs no introduction. But Dr. Gabor Mate speaks and writes about a range of topics, including addiction, stress, and child development. For 12 years, he worked in Vancouver's downtown east side with patients challenged by hardcore drug addiction, mental illness, and HIV, including at Vancouver's supervised injection site. He's written several best-selling books, including the award-winning In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, When the Body Says No, the Cost of Hidden Stress, and he's co-authored Hold On to Your Kids. And all of his books are for sale today in our bookstore, which is just down at the end of the hall on the right. They're all grouped together, so please go check those out during the break and afterwards. His works have been published internationally in 20 languages, and he's an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Criminology at Simon Fraser University. It is our honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Gabor Mate. Thank you. Claire, just for the sake of uh, clarity, my name is Gab Gabor. Nobody says it. I, I, it's okay. It's just every once in a while I like to hear it pronounced properly, so I say it, so I say it myself. You know. <laughs> so thank you all for coming out on a Easter Sunday. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here back at CIS. So what I'll be talking about is what I learned in, uh, before I did my addiction work, I worked for 20 years as a family physician, and for seven years, I was the medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, looking after terminally ill people. So I, I saw lots of people die, and I saw lots of people grieving death. And both in family practice and in palliative care work, it began to strike me with increasing force that who got sick and who didn't wasn't accidental. Uh, the, the, the perspective of the medicine in which I was trained, which is allopathic Western medicine, is pretty much that diseases are caused by external agents, such as, say, tobacco smoke, or they're caused by genetic uh, predetermination, such as, um, say, certain breast cancer genes. Remember Angelina Jolly last year had double mastectomy because she's got the breast cancer genes. Her mother died of breast cancer. She didn't want to take the risk. By the way, can you hear me okay at the back? No. Can you? Yes? No? No. So can we do something about the sound? Okay, how's that now? Are we getting there? Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. So just uh, do let me know, okay, because sometimes, by the way, this is totally typical. I give this talk, which is all about how we are, what this talk will be all about is how we have difficulty stepping into our own shoes and expressing our needs. <laughs> and, uh, and typically somebody will come up to me afterwards and say, geez, you know, that was interesting, but I only heard half of what you said. <laughs> and I said, well, how come you didn't say anything? Well, I didn't want to bother you, you know. So if, you, if there's a problem with the sound, just, I mean, I just let me know right away, okay? So again, the Western medicine in which I was trained considers disease to be, for the most part, what they call idiopathic, which means we don't know what causes it. In other words, it's bad luck. Or it's genetic, uh, or it's due to external factors. But the idea that the disease actually represents some significant message about how you live your life. What I mean by that is how you live your internal life, how you relate to yourself, and how you relate to other people. That escapes us. And that escapes us because we separate things that cannot be separated in real life. We separate the mind from the body. So by and large, we're trained as physicians to study the kidney and is this, what can go wrong with the kidney? Well, you can get inflammation or degeneration or obstruction 
What can go wrong with the heart? Well, you can get degeneration or inflammation or obstruction. What can go wrong with the, with the brain? Well, you can get degeneration or obstruction or inflammation. And that's basically it. And, and this is due to factors we either don't understand or it's something from the outside causing it. But that the inflammation or the obstruction or the degeneration is actually the product of our life experience, let alone our emotional experience, that doesn't occur to us. Because we separate the mind from the body and we separate the individual from the environment. And what I learned over the years is that those separations are completely incongruent with life. Because in life, those separations don't exist. Now, that's not news, by the way. It's not that I discovered this. I mean, it's only been thousands of years that we've known this. The traditional medicine of China has always assumed and understood that mind and body are inseparable. The Ayurvedic medicine of India, same thing. The shamanic medicinal practices of tribal cultures around the world have always taken for granted that mind and body and the individual and the environment can't be separated. So this split that we impose is strictly a Western phenomenon, but it's not new. It's become actually worse in the last 100 years or so because of the technologies that have enabled us to do some really terrific things which have further convinced us that we're right. You know, so we've got the pharmacology, uh, we have the imaging technology, we have the surgical techniques that were unheard of, unimaginable until a short time ago. And that has convinced us that our approach is right. But actually, when we look at chronic illness, we're not any better than we used to be. We have no idea in the Western model what cancer is really all about. And for all the hundreds of billions of dollars spent on cancer research, we're hardly closer to really solving the mystery of cancer than we were uh, ever. The mystery of chronic illness, like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. Now let me tell you about multiple sclerosis. It's a condition in which there's a degeneration of the nervous system leading to uh, blindness sometimes, paralysis, numbness, loss of function. In the 1940s, the gender ratio of, of um, multiple sclerosis in Canada, where I live, was one to one. So for one man diagnosed, so was a, so was a woman. Pretty much the same in the US, maybe the women a bit more. But now, the gender ratio is tilting such that in Canada now, three and a half women are being diagnosed for every man. Now, something's happened over the last 70 years to create that. And uh, the traditional model does not allow us to understand what may have happened. Now, by the end of the talk, if I forget to mention it, just ask me, please. But perhaps you'll find it yourself in, in what I'll be telling you uh, to explain that otherwise inexplicable phenomena. So again, in the, the transaction between patient and doctor in Western medicine is, <coughs> excuse me, the patient comes in and says, I got this symptom, please get rid of it for me. Or I got this disease, please get rid of it for me. And the doctor says, I'll do my best to get rid of your symptom, and I'll do my best to get rid of your disease, and if I can't get rid of it, I'll do my best to make you comfortable with it, physically. That's basically it. But the question, does this disease have a meaning in my life? Does it somehow represent how I've lived my life or how my life has unfolded since I was conceived and maybe even how my grandparents lived their lives? That never occurs to us. And what I'm suggesting is that what I found, and not only did I find, but the evidence is incontrovertible, that in fact disease is not an accident, nor is it simply genetic inheritance or some external agent. Now take lung cancer. So the belief is, is that lung cancer is caused by tobacco smoke, right? And sure enough, 95% of people who get lung cancer are smokers. So there's no question that smoking is a major risk factor for lung cancer. But it is not true to say that smoking causes lung cancer. It cannot be true to say that, because if it was the case, then everybody who smoked would get lung cancer. 
but most people who smoke do not get lung cancer. So smoking cannot be the cause, because if A is the cause of B, then every time you see A, you should see B. And if you don't, then A cannot be the cause of B. It might be a contributing cause, let alone the people that get lung cancer who don't smoke. So there's going to be something else going on. And that something else is what we need to be looking at today. So I'll read you some clippings from a Canadian newspaper called The Globe and Mail, for which I used to be a medical columnist some years ago. And this first article is by a woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, her husband, Hai, had another wife, a first wife, who died of breast cancer. And now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with it. And the doctor's name is Harold. <clears throat> and here's Donna's first person account of her diagnosis. Harold, the doctor, tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hai's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about Hai, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, what do you notice? Anything, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah? Uh, she's worried about him. She's got the cancer. Uh, she's concerned about his emotional stability and how he'll do it. Exactly. She, she's the one with this potentially terminal illness. She's the one that's going to have to go through radiation, chemotherapy, possibly sur for sure surgery. And she's worried about how will I support him? Now, this characteristic of automatic concern for the needs of others while ignoring your own is an absolute risk factor for cancer and chronic illness in general. For reasons I hope to convey to you today. The others I will read you are obituaries. <clears throat> now obituaries are fascinating because uh, they tell us not only about the people who die but also about what we value in one another. And what we value is exactly what kills us. Sometimes. In fact, you heard the expression, the good die young. And they do. They do. The good often die young. And then everybody goes to their, hi, everybody goes to their um, funerals, and hundreds of people are weeping about what wonderful people they were, and how kind they were, and how giving they were. And they don't get that that's what killed them. <laughs> this is not to say that kindness and giving kills us. But there's a distinction, which I hope to make clear to you. Anyway, so these obituaries then are about people <coughs> who died uh, with cancer in their 50s in most cases. This is a physician in Toronto. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto's Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. Now. If a friend of yours is diagnosed with cancer, would you say to her or him, hey, here's what you do. Go back to work tomorrow. And not for a moment stop to consider your life or what this might mean. And all the while receiving treatment, chemotherapy, whatever's going on with you, just keep working every day and keep going until you drop. So this automatic identification, this, this rigid and compulsive identification with duty, role and responsibility is the second major factor for chronic illness, risk factor for chronic illness. The, the next obituary is about a woman age 55 who died of breast cancer. The obituary was written by her husband, <laughs> a very appreciative husband, who writes, in her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst she could say was fooey or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. Now I know that many of you who have partners, spouses, sometimes you wish that they would blend into the environment <laughs> in, a, in an unassuming manner. But the fact is that what this woman lacked was the capacity to say no to actually to get angry sometimes in a healthy way. And so that suppression of, of healthy aggression 
is a significant risk factor for cancer and chronic illness. And I'll read you one more. This is almost, um, you might think I made this one up, but I didn't. Uh, another physician who died of cancer, Sidney his name was. Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife Rosalind and their four kids waited for him at home. Sidney would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy. Oh, look at that one. How are you going to enjoy another dinner? <laughs> Never wanting to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney kept eating, eating two dinners a day for years until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. <laughs> and this is in an obituary to show what a great guy Sidney was. He suffered from two terminal beliefs. One is that he was responsible for other people feel. The second is that he must never disappoint anybody. So these, these and I'm not laughing at these people. I, if, if, I'm, if I'm smiling at all, it's about the naivete of these beliefs. That this automatic regard for the needs of others while ignoring your own. This rigid and compulsive identification with duty, role, and responsibility. This inability to express what you really feel about things. The need to fit in. This fear of disappointing others. This belief that you're responsible for how other people feel. Now, I, I will tell you how these factors actually lead to illness, but the example I always give, because it's so vivid, is that of ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is this mysterious condition in which the nervous system basically just dies. The motor nerves that activate the limbs and the trunk, or the muscles of swallowing or speech, become paralyzed. And death is usually due to respiratory failure. It's terminal in virtually all cases. And most people die within very few years of diagnosis. And again, we don't know the cause. But I think we don't know the cause only because we're not looking. So a woman came to me for a second opinion some years ago. She was a teacher and a vice principal. And she found that she couldn't hold the pen at some point in her hands because her fingers just wouldn't grasp it. And she also began to experience difficulty walking. And this is some months before she came to see me. By the time she came to see me, she had been diagnosed with ALS. She wanted a second opinion. <coughs> now, she had been diagnosed by a world expert in ALS, and it was clear that that was the condition all right. But when I got the history, it, it got very interesting. When this began to happen, and this began to happen, she didn't go to a doctor. What she did was she got up at 5 o'clock every morning because it took her a long time to get dressed. And then she would get herself to school early, and then grasping the chalk in her clenched fist, she would scrawl the day's lesson on the board for the students. She would work the whole day, stay up late the next night preparing the next day's lesson, and repeat the performance the next morning for months until she could literally no longer walk. And that's when she first went to see for, seek medical help. Now, it turns out that nobody with ALS is any different. That all the cases of ALS I ever saw in palliative care or all the people I interviewed or anybody I ever read about, the same characteristic, this refusing help from others, and I can do this myself, and I need to do it myself. In writing this book, when the body says no, I, uh, and this is the Canadian version of it, it's not what the American version looks like, but it's the same text, I interviewed a lot of people with different illnesses, I reviewed my own cases, 
and I looked at the medical literature. So it turns out there was a study done at Yale University Medical School on people with ALS. And here's what they found. They said, hard steady work, sorry, let me just find this quote here. Yeah. These patients invariably evoked admiration and respect from all staff who came into contact with them. Characteristic was their attempt to avoid asking for help. Hard steady work without recourse to help from others was pervasive. They seemed to have been a habitual denial, suppression of fear, anxiety, sadness, most expressed the necessity to be cheerful, and so on. In other words, exactly what I found in my experience with ALS patients. And then what I also did is I looked at the biography of famous people who I knew had, had certain diseases. So I looked up Gilda Radner, the comedian, and her ovarian cancer, looked up her biography, looked at the biography of Betty Ford and her breast cancer, looked at the biography of Lou Gehrig and his Lou Gehrig's disease, which is ALS. Lou Gehrig, for the younger of you, being a famous baseball player who was a star with the New York Yankees in the 1930s and I think early 40s, whose record for a number of hits was only broken a couple of years ago by Derek Jeter of the Yankees. And who set another very famous record, though? Does anyone remember what that was? It was games consecutively played. Games con consecutive games played. He never missed a game. And it turns out he never, not, it's not that he was never injured. At one point, his hands were x-rayed, and it turns out that his fingers had been fractured 17 different times. And his teammates described him as grimacing like a maddened monkey in agony as he fielded the ball, but he still never missed a game. Or he had a flu, and he would still play. And on the other hand, when a young teammate of his, a rookie, got sick with the flu and was unable to play, and the manager was very upset with the kid, Gary said, what are you talking about? He's got a flu, he can't play. And Gary took the kid to his own home where he lived with his mom. His mom put the rookie into Gary's own bed. Lou slept on the living room couch while his mother nursed his kid back to health. But he never missed a game until he could no longer drag himself around the baseball diamond. And they said he was the nicest guy in the world. And I'm saying that that's why the illness. When there's a rigidity in our emotional responses, and the rigidity that we impose on ourselves, that results in rigidity of our nervous system because you can't separate the mind from the body. And I'll talk to you about that in more detail. The question now is, if I develop this perspective, am I blaming the patient? And there was a very famous essay by Susan Sontag, Cancer's Metaphor, when she had breast cancer. I think it was breast cancer, but cancer anyway. And she just absolutely militantly and even um, with some degree of hostility rejected the idea that there's anything about the patient's life that accounts for the disease. And she thought that was blaming the patient. And this blaming the patient is what's brought out as the counter to the case that I'm making here today. Well, the fact is we're not blaming anybody because what happens when we look at the lives of these people so the school teacher I told you about, when I got her life history, began with an adoption. She was an adopted child. And shortly after she was adopted, the adoptive mother gets pregnant, which, by the way, is not unusual. And it tells us something about infertility and stress. When you're really striving for something and you're totally attached to it, and then you let go, guess what? It happens. Not the first time in life that we would have learned that lesson, right? Anyway, the, the adoptive mother gets pregnant. You can imagine what the story is from there. The story is that the adopted child never feels that she's as welcome to exist as the biological child. So she compensates by suppressing her needs and by making herself no trouble at all for the parents. Now they will perhaps accept her. The problem is that those early coping patterns then become our personalities. 
and what we think of the personality, and we think we are the personality, we're not the personality. The personality is who we're not, actually, very often. And let me read you a quote here from an article from the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Association. This came out two years ago. Now, they're not talking about what I'm talking about, because I don't think they had that vision exactly. But, but they are talking about what I'm talking about, except maybe they don't know it. But here's what they say. Growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity or stress can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which make them at a significant cost to long-term long outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the way we adapt to early environment helps us survive early environment, but then it exacts a, exacts a cost later on. So this woman adapted to her environment by suppressing herself so as not to make trouble, so as she'd be more accepted. Basically, it's her substitute for being loved. The trouble is that when we adapt those coping mechanisms early in life, we can't let go of them. Because we're not even aware. We think that's us. And the analogy is something like this. Imagine that you are on the North Pole uh, in freezing cold or beyond, below freezing cold and you, and you put on a heavy fur coat which will save your life. But then imagine that you're transported to, this, to the equator still wearing that coat. That coat will not kill you. Help you survive in one environment, kill you in another. It's the same with these early coping patterns that we adopt. And so that virtually all problems that we face later on in life are as a result of these early adaptive patterns that we had to willy-nilly adapt. And we didn't even adapt them consciously or knowingly, which makes it all the more difficult to let go of them. But we're still stuck in them. So as one particular uh, writer says, it's a question of redeeming our life from our history redeeming our life from our history, because our history uh, becomes our life until we consciously realize that, no, we may have a choice in the matter. The child has no choice in the matter. Now, what happens when you look at Lou Gehrig's life? Lou Gehrig's father was an alcoholic. Now, <clears throat> those of you that may have grown up in homes that was alcoholism, what happens in the child-parent relationship in such homes? Anybody can, sorry? Well, the, but, but how does the child adapt? The child becomes the parent. The child becomes the parent. That's called the parentification of the child. It's a role reversal. And that role reversal invariably results in pathology for the child later on. But that's how they survived. And so Gehrig's father was an alcoholic. And Gehrig became the caretaker to her mother. And that meant to his mother. And that meant never, ever saying no and always being, quote unquote, responsible. And that's why he never missed a game. It's no great achievement not to miss a game when you've got a flu. The achievement is to stay home. In Canada, there's a very famous example of this. He's a national hero. Some of you may have heard of him in the US, although we tend to hear a lot more about you guys than you hear about us uh, <laughs> in the general room. His name is Terry Fox. And Terry Fox was a teenager who had developed bone cancer in his leg. And his leg had to be amputated below the knee. And Terry then decides, I think 17 or 18, I'm not sure how old he was. Uh, Terry then decides to, maybe a bit older, uh, to run across the country, to jog across the country with his prosthesis as a way of raising awareness of cancer halfway across this trip, or, and, and, and there's this iconic image of this young guy with curly hair and determined expression on his face running along the Canadian highway with this metal leg. And of course, it became a national cause. And then, about halfway through his journey, it turned out the cancer had come back. Now, 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 Terry is a Canadian icon, and he's like a saint. And certainly an admirable uh, person for his courage, determination. But is he an example to, to, to follow? Does anybody actually believe 
that the return of his cancer was unrelated to the stress he put himself under. And I don't know what his early years were like, but I'm pretty sure I could tell. So we're looking at adaptations here. And in the book, I give a, an example of myself doing this. Like, this is not, this is very general. We all do this to one degree or another. So in this example, I'm visiting my mother in a nursing home. My mother had muscular dystrophy, a genetic disease that runs in our family. And um, so she was unable to move. Uh, by the end of her life. Uh, she was mentally very with it, emotionally strong, physically disabled. So I'm visiting her, and that afternoon, as I walk down the hall in the nursing home, I have a bit of a limp. And I have a limp because that morning I had had arthroscopic surgery, surgery uh, to remove a torn cartilage from my knee, which I incurred by jogging on cement, and it used to hurt. But as a physician, I never learned the, the, the possible connection between pain and tissue damage. And so uh, <laughs> I, I, can eat, I continue to jog on cement until I had the surgery. So that afternoon, I have a bit of a limp. Except when I walk into my mother's room, the limp completely disappears. And I walk into the room with a perfectly nonchalant gait, greet her, we have a visit. I walk out, shut the door, and start limping again. Now what was I doing? What was I doing? Protecting, Protecting my mother from? From worrying about you. From knowing about my pain. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the deal. My mother was 78 at the time. I was 54. My mother had survived the genocide of the Second World War, the death of her parents in Auschwitz. She survived the communist dictatorship in Hungary the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, emigration to Canada when she was 39, 38 with two adolescent boys, the birth of a new child in a new country when she was nearly 40, learning a new language, making her a new, a new home in an utterly different culture, and all that, the death of my father subsequently. Do you think she needed to be protected from the fact that her middle-aged son had a bit of a limp the afternoon of arthroscopic knee surgery, you know? So what was I doing? Well, I'll tell you what I was doing. You were taking care of your mother first. What's that? You put your mother first. I did, but the question is why? Why did I do that? And, and she did not need that. She did not need me, put, me to put her first. What's that? It's, yeah, it's, it's an adaptation, absolutely. And here's the deal. I, uh, so I, if you read my books, you, you'll notice that I, I was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1944, the Jewish parents. And this is two months before the Germans occupy Hungary. So two months before the genocide descends upon the Jews of my country. So I'm two months old at the time. And the Wehrmacht, the German army, marches into Budapest. And the next day, my mother calls the pediatrician and says, would you please come and see Gabor? Of course, he's crying all the time. And the pediatrician says, of course I will come. But I should tell you, all my Jewish babies are crying. So Almas, A.H. Almas, the California-based spiritual teacher, who I think was speaking here this weekend, he says in one of his books, the child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body and can also feel the tension, rigidity, and pain in the body of the mother or of anyone else he's with. If the, child is, if the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. So here's what happens. And this is really the core of what I'll tell you the whole day. The child has two needs. The child has an absolute need for attachment, attachment being loved. Uh, I know we talk about attachment in the Buddhist sense, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. Right now I'm talking about the attachment relationship, that dynamic that draws us close to other people. And without that dynamic, and without our brains being wired for attachment, we would not survive because simply we're so helpless and utterly dependent as infants. So without somebody taking care of us and us being cute enough that they will want to, <laughs> which is why as babies we pretend to be so cute, 
you know. <laughs> and some of us as adults go through life still trying to pretend to be cute. Because it's a way of uh, trying to get some love. So without attachment, we don't survive. So that's an absolute need. It's, it's, it's non-negotiable. <clears throat> we have another need. That need is for authenticity. Authenticity out of the self. An automobile is a self-propelled mobile. So authenticity has to do with being our true selves. And being our true selves is not some abstract con uh, concept. Being our true selves simply, knows, simply means, what am I feeling at the moment? And how can I manifest what I'm feeling? Now, this is a subject of deep psychological exploration. It's very simple. In the wild, if you're not in touch with your gut feelings, you just don't survive. So from the evolutionary perspective, being in touch with the self is absolutely essential. So that's another huge need. Attachment and authenticity. Terrific. But what happens when, for whatever reason, the environment cannot handle our authenticity? So the child is in this dilemma. Am I going to be authentic or will I get attachment in my life? For example, your parents can't handle your anger when you're two years old. Or, in my case, I get the message that my mother is already so stressed that if I want to maintain a relationship with her, I better not add to it by having my own pain. Authenticity would be to cry out my pain. Now, I remember being four, five or six years old, four or five maybe, having severe ear infection and very deep throbbing ear pain in the middle of the night and just whimpering to myself and not calling to my mother or father. Well, that's based on my, that's an adaptation because my mother and father would have wanted me to call them. They would have wanted me to call them. But I got the message in my first months of life not to do that. That's how I adapted. So it's an adaptation. So when we adapt like that, we give up authenticity. And then we become 40 years old, or 50, or 60, or 35, and they say, I don't know who I am. What's going on? Who's living this life? Because we gave up authenticity as an adaptation. It wasn't a mistake. It's what we had to do. It was a brilliant strategy, except it wasn't strategy, because strategy is conscious. We weren't conscious of it. And that's the dilemma in chronic illness. So what I'm saying to you is that all chronic illness represents uh, a surrender of the authentic self. And then the disease comes along to teach us, to, to, to come back to ourselves. I'm not recommending it as a way of learning. I'm only saying that when it happens, that's why it happens. And that's what the meaning is. So to quote um, James Hollis, Virtually all of us lack a deep sense of permission to lead our own lives. We learned very early that the world exacted conditions that, if not met, could result in punishment or abandonment. Only when the ego has reached a certain level of strength, or perhaps more commonly, driven by desperation to make a different choice, can we overthrow the tyranny of history. And that desperation often comes from things that go wrong in our lives, including physical or mental illness. So the, the meaning of illness is actually to bring us back to ourselves. And that's why metaphors like the war on cancer, and I've been battling cancer for all these years. Now, that's the word I always use. So and so battled cancer bravely. Now consider that the issue is not to battle it. I'm not saying not to get it treated. I'm talking about the attitude we take towards it. If we see it as an enemy and we battle it, we create a certain energy about ourselves. If we actually see it as something that happened to teach us something, we may still wish to get treated for it, but we will take an utterly different relationship to ourselves and to the illness in the process. And if we actually are willing to learn what it has to teach us, we might have a much more happy outcome, and even if the outcome is physically not any different, we'll be at much more peace with it. Let me read you something here. This is an email I got from a friend of mine who was doing research at Johns Hopkins University with um, 
psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms, of course. And the research is about um, helping people at the end of life with psychedelic psychotherapy under the influence of psychedelic, uh, psychedelic substances, in this case, psilocybin. So my friend writes, here's a session report from an apparently lower dose session, talking about the dose of psilocybin, which I thought was pretty relevant, pretty sweet, from a 45-year-old Georgia man with lymphoma, which he was first diagnosed with in his late 20s. So this is the patient report. The first three hours of uh, laying on the couch with the eye mask and the headphones produced a profound spiritual experience that I do not believe would have been possible without the assistance of psilocybin and the support of my friend. I realized that although my cancer is in remission due to the chemo treatments and the stem cell transplant, I envisioned my body was left, I envisioned my body left like a gray dead skeleton and I had not spiritually made a full recovery. This was the point that I realized that I could not achieve the spiritual connection to God or the world around me unless I could once again open my mind and my heart to appreciate the simple gifts of life like a smile and the laughter I had lost. At that point I laughed out loud and I shared that it would be just as unrealistic to expect my six-month-old six grandson to stand up and start running before being able to walk as it would be for me to have a spiritual connection to God that I had lost due to my resentment I felt over having to battle cancer once again until I was ready to make the baby steps of appreciating daily laughter and smiles. I now realize that I am in control of my ability to forge a deeper spiritual connection by appreciating, appreciating each day as the gift it is. Now it took the cancer and it took him accepting the cancer and the teaching to get to that point. He was able to do that with, with the help that he received, but that's what the illness came to teach him in the first place. And how many of you, either in your personal life or for yourself, or have known others who've had, had significant illness and in the end would end up saying, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Have you had that experience? Yeah. Well, that's what people are talking about. People are talking about that. What is the best thing? Almas talks, talks about the self as the precious pearl. So, uh, so that what actually happens is that the illness comes along and helps you find that precious pearl of your true self. And that's higher than anything else. And it's actually something that even people terminally ill will say they're so glad to have found, even if it means they have to die. Because that's what Jesus calls the eternal life. I'm sorry? Okay, now you know, uh, let's get you the mic so we can hear you. Just, just say that again. No, hold it. Mike is not on yet. Mike is still not on. I am bilingual, 73 years young, and I couldn't understand the last part that you say about Jesus, if whoever believes in him uh, calls eternal life. Could you give me a little more information about that, please? About what, sorry? Jesus' eternal statement that... The, the eternal life? Yes. Thank you. So, here's a Jewish guy on Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to t trying to tell you what Jesus meant about the eternal life. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think it means. It means the life that wasn't given to us the life that we didn't develop as a way of trying to survive life. It means a life that was us to start with. Before we began to adapt. Before we gave up our connection to the authentic self. It means the life that is not identified with any particular aspect of us. It means the life that isn't identified with the particular body shape I have right now. Thank God, because that body shape is going to go south very soon. 
uh, it isn't the life that thinks that it's my thoughts or the emotions I'm having at the moment. That's what's eternal. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. So, now the question is, <clears throat> how do these patterns that I described to you then uh, lead to illness? By the way, let me just stop here for a minute and thank you for pioneering the questioning. Are there any questions or comments at this point from anybody? And uh, yeah, please put your hand up and the mic will come to you. Yes, so what about this, the, the so-called inherited diseases? Because I am developing three of them, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and blood sugar problems. My mm -hmm. grandfather was a diabetic who inject, injected insulin. Mm -hmm. So how is that um, related to this sort of end point of a multi-generational emotional process? Okay, well, I'll grant that there's some people who inherit genes that predispose to certain illnesses. So one of them is in my family. I mentioned it, uh, muscular dystrophy. My aunt had it. My mother had it. One of my brothers has it. When you get the gene with that condition, you're pretty much going to get the disease. Those diseases are extraordinarily rare. You may see them in 10,000 in the population. So they include Huntington's Korea. They include muscular dystrophy of various kinds. Um, there are some others. There are also genes that make it more likely you're going to get breast cancer. And so that's what I mentioned with Angelina Jolie. However, if you look at 100 women with breast cancer, only seven have the gene. 93 do not. And out of 100 women with the gene, not all of them will get the cancer. So the diseases where the gene specifically determines that you're going to get the illness are very, very, very rare. Now, I don't, know, I don't know whether you got genes for high blood pressure. The fact that your grandfather had it and that you had it doesn't tell me that, that you necessarily have a gene. If you look at the, if you look at the um, I mean, you might, but that would be very rare. Most cases of high blood pressure have nothing to do with genetics. And if you look at the very word for high blood pressure, well, how, what do we call high blood pressure in medical terms? Hi, think about it. Hypertension. Maybe there's too much tension in your life. Maybe there's been too much tension in your life from the very beginnings of your life. Maybe your mother had a lot of tension from the moment you were conceived. And there was abuse passed down. There was what? Abuse. Abuse, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So, and, and I'll talk about the physiology of it uh, a little bit later, in fact, very soon, of how this translates to the physiology. But, but if you're asking, is it genetic, I'm saying likely it's not. If you're saying, is it transgenerational, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So stress and trauma are multigenerational. There are some diseases that are genetically multigenerational, but very rare, very rare. And most illnesses we're talking about are not based on genetics. And sometimes, and very often, even if there's a gene that might predispose, it doesn't mean you're going to get the illness. It still depends on the environment, because genes are turned on and off by the environment, which is called epigenetics. Let me give you a very interesting example. Um, not of an illness, but of a behavior. In New Zealand, they did a study of people who were violent, for violence. They looked at a certain number of people for degrees of violence. And some people were found to be very violent, and these people had a certain gene, a, a genetic difference. But the interesting thing was that in the same population, there were also people who were less violent than average, and they had the same gene as the very violent people. So you had the same gene, and it usually meant you're going to be less violent or more violent. So the gene was not for violence. What do you think it might have been for? Well, it turned out that the people that were less violent were brought up in very nurturing homes. The people that were violent were brought up in abusive homes. And what that meant is that the gene was for sensitivity to the environment. So when bad things happened, they were more sensitive to that, and it made them more aggressive. 
And when they were nurtured and dealt with peacefully, they were very sensitive to that, and they became more peaceful than average. So genes create sensitivities. They very rarely, they very rarely uh, lead to specific diseases or specific behaviors. Well, uh, it turns out, any other questions right now? Yeah, and the mic over there, please. Hi, um, I want to ask about, specifically about um, diseases that come with genes that are very connected to genes. Like? Like um, um, molecular degeneration okay. or other. Okay. Um, in my yeah. family we have autoimmune sure. or different. I feel that especially in this, in this kind of disease there is a strong connection to the psychological genetics that you get, what you carry. Because even if you have the gene, it doesn't, have, doesn't mean that you're 100% going to have the disease. That's the point. So, especially in these illnesses that so many people in the family carry, there is so much psychological issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, because something runs in a family, it says nothing about genetics. Because we can pass on the same psychological stresses and traumas uh, from one generation to the next. So family history, multiple generations of illness, tells us nothing about genetics. And, um, and as you say, even if you have the gene, it doesn't mean you'll get the disease. So it still depends upon the, uh, what evokes the, what turns the gene on or what turns the gene off. And autoimmune illnesses, while you can certainly show some genetic predisposition, you cannot show that they're transmitted genetically. Because to show that they're transmitted genetically, everybody with the gene would have to get the disease, and they don't. So the question is then what, and, and, and this is what we really have to understand, um, not so much for purpose of this conversation, but I mean medically, is that genes are turned on and off by the environment. So the uh, genes rather than determining things, genes actually are turned on and off. They're governed by the environment. And that's, that science is called epigenetics. Epigenetics studies how genes are modulated by the environment. And, and I could talk to you a lot about that, but I won't at the moment. A uh, question here? Will you talk uh, about epigenetics? Will I talk about epigenetics? Well, what would you like me to say about it? What, what I wanted to ask you is um, in the idea of epigenetics, turning gene expression on and off, yeah. do you feel that perhaps you have turned off um, a genetic expression for muscular dystrophy? Or can one do that? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure that I know the answer. Uh, if, if, to tell you the answer, I'd have to be genetically tested for muscular dystrophy, and I have not been. I've been clinically examined. I was told that by my age, if I had it, I'd be showing some signs of it. But. Theoretically, your question is absolutely valid, and the only way to find out is if I underwent the genetic testing. A friend of mine who's a world-famous researcher in um, Huntington's Korea, which is what Woody Guthrie died with, and Arlo, as you know, does not have the gene. He said that in Huntington's, if you get the gene, your risk of getting the disease is 99%. But that means there's one person out of 100 who's got the gene who's not going to have the disease. Well, there's got to be something epigenetic going on there. So I don't know in my case what the situation is. I rather suspect I don't have the gene. I hope, to the, I hope for the sake of my children that I don't. Um, I suppose I could get tested for it to know for sure, but uh, more likely I don't. Certainly, in a more common case, such as breast cancer, where there are these genes, these breast cancer genes, which most people with breast cancer do not have, but there's some that do, and they will still not all get the disease. Well, there has to be something epigenetic there. There's, there has to be something that turned the gene on in some people and didn't turn it on in other people. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think 
I can speak to this a little bit personally, um, sure. the medical phenomenon, because um, I'm the first in my family to um, have RA, um, juvenile RA and okay. juvenile degenerative disc disease. And um, through, you know, genetic testing, I found out that I had the gene and um, and basically with a lot of intense emotional treatment and a lot of dietary treatment and spiritual revelations and stuff, my RA symptoms have gone down. But the problem is, is that medical doctors reject the progress and they reject the, um, you know, what, what my body's been through and basically compartmentalize it and go, well, we don't understand how that works, but just keep doing what you're doing. So why is that a problem? Well, it's not a problem, but um, I think part of the reason why we don't commonly hear of it is yeah, because there's right. not enough doctors that are willing to yeah, sure. look but at the conundrum. So let me tell you a story. Okay, thanks for that comment. Uh, are, you, are you complete? Are you complete with what you're going to say? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let me tell you a story then. Uh, Nasruddin, have you heard of Nasruddin? Nasruddin being this Sufi sage and mullah and fool, you know, that in, in all of his adventures and stories, there's always a teaching. And sometimes he's wise, and sometimes he's a fool. But it, it's all about what can you learn. So Nasruddin has got this donkey, and his neighbor comes over and says, Nasruddin, can I borrow your donkey just for one day? And Nasruddin says, yeah, I'd love to lend you my donkey, and you're my favorite neighbor, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. But it just so happens, though, unfortunately, my brother took the donkey to market just this morning. Neighbor says, oh, okay, well, thank you. And as he starts to walk out of the yard, the donkey brays in the barn next door to them. <laughs> and the neighbor says, Nazruddin, just a minute. If your brother took the donkey to the market, then what was that? Nazruddin says, well, who are you going to believe, me or that stupid donkey? <laughs> okay. Well, in this case, who are you going to believe? Your own experience, you know? Your own experience is the donkey here. You know, the doctors are, Nazruddin, denying your experience. You know, who are you going to believe? Let them have their, they do what, you know, like, they do what they can do for you. And that was probably helpful to you. And, and they can't do what they can't see. It's not a problem. Okay? Yes, a hand over there. Hi, good morning. Um, you will probably get to this, but I was curious, um, like on a more collective level, like speaking of intergenerational trauma and historical trauma and the right. behavioral patterns and illnesses that befall people. And I was thinking about just how you can grow up in a really healthy family and poverty itself as a trauma and how even with the individual sense of this, like if a person is made sick by their environment, by you know toxicity being dumped into the rivers, et cetera, and we're looking just at like their emotions, and I don't know if that's enough, like if we're not, like if we're looking too much at the individual still and not so much at like the individual as a representation of the collective illness and how we, like I th I'm pretty sure you're, you're looking at that and I'm curious about what you've found. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I completely understood your question, but, but let me give you an answer and, see, and let, you can tell me if that's, okay. I, I think that illness in an individual is always a manifestation of collective and multi-generational dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung said that an individual is not just a single separate being, but by his very existence presupposes a collective relationship. And uh, there was a series of articles in the New York Times a few years ago about cancer, and they quoted somebody who very astutely said, that trying to find the cause of cancer inside the individual cell is like trying to understand a traffic jam by studying the internal combustion engine. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. Now, does that cover what you're asking, or is it slightly different? Um, let me just hear you out more, and I'll I'll okay. keep thinking about I'll it. Come back to it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, another hand here. Uh, in your book, if I in uh, Body Says No, uh, if I remember correctly, you were saying that most of these conditions, or at least the antecedents to those uh, degenerative diseases, come early in life from these these traumas that right. happen. Uh, I'm curious if 
things a little bit later in life. Uh, stresses, bullying, uh, shaming, that sort of thing can affect it or if the priest, uh, if the assumption is that, that these early, early childhood things during brain development are the, the antecedents to what allow the shame and, and the bullying and that sort of thing, if I'm making sense. Okay, I'll, I'll certainly answer your question, which is very clear, but before I do, if you want to hold on to the mic for a second, let me just ask you, um, and you, you don't have to answer this, it's just an invitation. Um, are you talking about anything personal? No, it, it has more, it's a more it, probably, but, <laughs> but, but not anything I can consciously think of. Okay, fair enough. Then I'll just answer the question as stated. Um, so my answer is no. It, 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 it happens later on, but only later on, it will not have that kind of impact. So let me give you an example, a very famous example, actually. There is uh, Viktor Frankl, whose work you probably heard of, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl being, a, I think, an Austrian uh, Jewish um, man who ends up in one of the concentration camps uh, in during the Second World War and survives. And I, I think he's at Dachau or Buchenwald, I'm not sure where he's at. Sorry? No, he wasn't Auschwitz. Was it Franklin Auschwitz? I don't think so. Maybe he ended up there. But in this particular, he, uh, in this particular example I'm going to give you, he's, he's in Germany somewhere. Uh, and he, he's looking out at the countryside in the middle of this horror and he's looking out at the countryside, and he sees the beauty of God's universe. Now, in the middle of a concentration camp. Now, I can tell you, knowing myself, the way I'm constituted, if I was in that experience, I would not be seeing the beauty of God's world. I'd be full of rage, resentment, despair, hatred. Certainly at that age, I would have been. Even now, <laughs> let me tell you what happened Monday night. Never mind. No. Uh, I bet that Frankel had a lovely first three years of life. And, the first, and, and those experiences that embittered or traumatized others did not touch him the same way. If you look at people with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, soldiers that experience the terrible death of their comrades, they develop PTSD, all of them had been traumatized in childhood. That's why out of 100 people who go through that experience, 20 will get PTSD and 80 will not. So by the time we get to be adults or even adolescents, our responses to stress our hormonal reactions, our neurological set points, our cardiovascular um, states are pretty much programmed. And uh, that then will define how we respond. And that's why when you treat PTSD and you're only looking at the incident, you're never going to get anywhere because that's not the cause. There's another hand somewhere. So what are the um, possibilities or techniques or chances of making changes in those early um, adaptive responses? Fair enough, and I, I would hope to come to that uh, later on when we, when we get into it, and we'll do some exercises here together as well. And, um, but the point is first to be really aware of it. And, and uh, the key phrase you might say then is from the Course on Miracles, where they say that you're never upset about what you're upset about. So that whatever's going on in the present and whatever reaction you have, that's not the, that's not the ultimate cause of your reaction. But, but yeah, we have to go back to what happened originally to understand it. So we, we will deal with that later. And if I, don't, if I don't deal with it satisfactorily, just please bring it up again. Okay? Thank you. And was there another hand back there? Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is like, at what level is this mind-body connection happening? Like, is this like a physiological level? Is this in a spiritual plane? Or, and also one more question is like, what scientific evidence and scientific studies, or where can I find information about that? Uh, 
nobody planted you today. This is, uh, you're not a planter, are you? Because it's perfect. That's exactly what we're going to talk about next. So thank you very much. I was just, you know, I'm a professional mind reader as well. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. <laughs> well, if you're a mind reader, why are you asking me? <laughs> okay, so that, then, then I just, great. I'm, I'm going to go right to the answer, okay? So it turns out that the insights of traditional medicines and Ayurvedic practices turn out to have been validated by Western science. So now we have the science to show why the body can't be separated from the mind and the individual from the environment. So when the medical profession talks about evidence-based practice, I always grit my teeth because I only wish that we actually looked at the evidence. The evidence is accumulating now for decades and uh, as I mentioned one of the st streams of that evidence is the science of epigenetics another is what's been called psychoneuroimmunology. Psychoneuroimmunology is uh, the study of how the psyche which is to say our emotional minds in this case and the nervous system and the immune system are not actually separate at all, but they're one unit. In fact, to give it its proper name, we really should call it psycho-neuro-immuno-endocrinology. Endocrinology referring to our hormonal apparatus. So the point is that the emotional apparatus that we have and the immune system and the nervous system and the immune system are not separate systems. They're one unit. And when we study them as separate, we're just looking at different manifestations of the same dynamic. But physiologically, they're not separated and cannot be separated. And let me give you a really obvious example. It takes no science at all. If I were to brandish a weapon all of a sudden and scream at you, I wouldn't have touched you at all, right? I didn't do anything physically to you at all. But I would have induced an emotion of fear in you. So in your... In your limbic apparatus, the emotional circuitry of your brain, there would be been deep fear. As a result of that emotion, what would happen to your body? In a split second, the hypothalamus, which is the structure in the brain that's at the apex of the body's autonomic nervous system, would have sent signals to the rest of your body. The hypothalamus is also at the apex of the body's hormonal apparatus. So it would have sent signals to another gland in the brain called the pituitary, which would have sent, along with the nerve messages from the hypothalamus, hormonal messages to the adrenal gland. Now adrenal means, renal means kidney, adrenal means on top of the kidney. The adrenal gland, in response to threat, will secrete two hormones. It will secrete a hormone named after it called adrenaline. And the adrenal gland, like the brain, has a cortex. Cortex means bark, as in the bark of a tree. And the cortex of the adrenal gland will secrete another hormone named after it called cortisol. The purpose of adrenaline and cortisol is to help you fight back or to escape, the so-called flight or fight response. So stress is actually a response to a threat. Now, nothing, nothing physically happened to you. Nobody touched you. Nobody gave you a chemical. Um, all that happened was that an emotion induced by some external event set off a f vast cascade of responses in your body that results in your blood pressure going up, your heart rate increasing, your muscles tensing, the blood flow being diverted from your intestines to your muscles so that they get more oxygen and the cortisol causing your sugar levels to go up so that you have more energy for the escape or flight mechanism. That's great in the short term. In the long term, however, if the stress is chronic, what happens to you? That same cortisol that in the short term allows you more energy to escape or to resist will now give you diabetes. This, and uh, the cortisol, what else will it do? 
It will thin your bones to get out to your process. What else will it do? It will reduce your immune system's activity, so you're more likely to get malignancy. Or it will exhaust itself, exhaust the stress mechanism, and now you get autoimmune disease, and to treat autoimmune disease, what are they going to give you? Cortisol. It'll cause ulcerations of your intestines. Put fat on your belly, increasing the risk of heart disease. So that's just a quick and obvious example of the mind-body unity. It doesn't even take a deep science. But we have the deep science. Because it turns out that these four systems that I mentioned, the nervous system, the immune system, the psychic apparatus, and the hormonal apparatus, are wired together in a number of ways. First of all, they're wired together by the nervous system itself. The nervous system forms a giant electrical grid that just unites these systems into one so that messages in the nervous system going back and forth within all these systems and the brain. So the, the nerves, and there's many more nerves from the body to the brain, by the way, than from the brain to the body. So the body's always talking to the brain, trying to tell it what's going on inside so the brain can orient its responses to the environment. And, of course, the brain receives messages from the outside and tells the body what to do as well. So there's nerve fibers from the bone marrow where red and white cells are manufactured to the brain and vice versa. From the spleen where the red cells are stored to the brain and vice versa. So that's the first connection, scientifically speaking, is the, physiologically speaking, the, the nervous system itself. The second connection, of course, is through uh, chemical messengers that they each secrete and for which they all have receptors so they can both send and receive messages to one another. So it turns out that the white cells in our circulation, which are immune cells, can manufacture every hormone. A hormone is a chemical messenger. The white cells in our circulation, our immune cells, can manufacture every hormone that the brain can manufacture, which means that the white cells are talking to the brain. And the brain is talking to the white cells. So that's the second form of connection. The third connection um, is the gut connection. So the gut is much more than an organ of digestion. What is it also? Well, it's a huge organ of immune uh, response because the, it has many immune centers to keep out uh, dangerous uh, toxins or bacteria. But the gut is something else as well. Let me ask you this question, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands if you would. If you've had the experience of having a powerful gut feeling about something and ignoring it and then regretting it afterwards, put your hand up. <laughs> uh, okay? Great. Now, I'm going to ask for the adverse experience. If you had the experience of having a strong gut feeling about something, ignoring it and being glad afterwards, now put your hand up. So one or two people put their hands up. You can see what the ratio is. So the odds are, if the guts are telling you something, go with it. Your chance of being wrong are like one in a hundred. Actually, I would even argue uh, that what you think is a gut feeling wasn't. It was just a strong emotion. And there's a, way, there's a distinction between the two. But the gut is just never wrong. And that's because another form of connection is the gut-brain connection. The gut sends many more messages to the brain than it receives. It's a huge nervous system organ. It's got many, many nerves. Serotonin, the chemical that's, you know, that we supplant in, in, when we treat depression with Prozac, the gut has more serotonin than the brain does. And it's very interesting about this gut-brain connection. What actually happens is that the gut receives the messages of the whole brain. So your intellect, the thinking part, is only one smart part of the brain. The whole brain is taking in the whole picture. And when the gut senses that, it'll give you some very powerful feelings. So when you ignore that, you're actually ignoring reality. And so in the wild, again, as we're evolving into human beings, if we ignored our gut feelings, we were ignoring reality. To ignore reality was to court death. So what happens here when I just asked you this question <clears throat> about how many of you ignored gut feelings and were sorry afterwards and just whatever you put the hand up, you just told me, you probably realized this, but you told me the story of your childhood. 
Because there's no, sorry? Ignoring your childhood? Ignoring the, no, you just told me the story of your childhood. Oh. You didn't ignore it, you told me the story of it. Because here's the deal, no infant is born without gut feelings. There's no one day old baby that says to himself, gee, I'm really hungry and I got a stomach ache and I'm wet and I'm really distressed and not only that, I'm lonely, but gee, mom and dad are working so hard. I, I better not bother them right now. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Ah! <laughs> He's expressing his gut feelings. What happened? Something happened. Somewhere along the line, you learned that to express your gut feelings and to trust them would put you into conflict with your attachment environment. <coughs> and that you adapted by suppressing your gut feelings or by ignoring them. And that's what shows up decades later in his hands going up in every room that I ever speak at. And that's because of the gut-brain connection. And it's very interesting. Um, as I mentioned in this book, Dr. Oliver Sacks, who is a neurologist, describes a group of patients who have lost the capacity to process language because of a stroke. And these people are watching President Ronald Reagan on television, and they're all laughing on this ward. And some of them are just angry at Reagan, but most of them are just laughing at him. And Sachs asks himself, well, what is it? Is it that they don't understand Reagan? Or is it that they understand him all too well? <laughs> And it turns out that on studies of aphasiacs, people that don't process language because of a stroke, they're much better able to tell when somebody's lying than the average person. They have about 80, 90% uh, certainty of knowing when somebody's a liar. Whereas the rest of us, it's 50-50, like tossing a coin. Why? Because what they've got to pay attention to is what the gut pays attention to, which is body language, tone of voice, facial expression, authenticity, integrity. Integrity meaning the wholeness of the individual. Whereas the rest of us get taken in by words. Which of course, what politicians and advertising agencies all rely on. If we weren't cut off from our gut feelings, capitalism would not be possible. <laughs> it's that simple. And so that's the gut-brain connection. There's a fourth connection as well, which I barely knew about when I wrote the book which is the heart-brain connection. It turns out that the heart itself has a nervous system. Uh, the, the pericardium, which is the fibrous sheath that encases the heart, is infused with a nervous system, and these nerves have some predictive capacity, especially for negative things. So when you say, I knew it in my heart, you did. And that nervous system here in the heart, in fact, there's a, you know, people who study that are called neurocardiologists studying the nervous system of the heart. And, and this, this brain here, the heart brain, is connected to this brain here. So that's another connection. Then there's all kinds of connections to do with electromagnetic waves being radiated from the heart and the brain. And, you know, but I'm sure that in 100 years, we'll have a much more sophisticated view. But enough is known already that we know that physiologically, the mind and the brain, the heart and the brain. Um, let me just gather my thoughts here. This is my third talk in two days, so I'm getting a bit punch drunk. So let me just pause for a moment. So we already know that the mind and the body cannot be separated physiologically. And again, even if we didn't have all the science, just the fact of your, your response when I scared you, that would tell us that's enough already. Now the point is, of course, that this connection doesn't just manifest when you're scared. It happens all the time, it's 24-7, you know, so that 24-7 there's these uh, communications going on. So that means whatever happens emotionally also shows up physiologically. And so before we take our break, we'll just do a little demonstration here of how that might show up in, um, in real life. So I just need a volunteer, um, I'll tell you what you volunteer for. Uh, in a minute, um, basically just a demonstration of one aspect of what I've talked about here. And uh, all, I, all I need you to do is to sit in your chair 
and agree with me that you won't leave your chair because your chair represents your life and this is a metaphor for your life and you can't leave your life. So I need somebody who's, who I can easily, thanks, physically reach. So thank you. And your name is? Beth. Beth. So Beth, so what I'm going to ask you is how comfortable are you with the distance between you and I right now? In other words, if I gave the rest of the lecture from here, is that okay with you? I'm totally comfortable. You're totally okay. And maybe the mic can come up here so that everybody can hear better. <coughs> So Beth is sitting there, and I'm standing here, and she's okay with the distance. So what now if I uh, stood here and I gave the lecture from here for the rest of the afternoon? How's that? That's good, too. So that's okay. How about right here? <laughs> um, it's a little more uncomfortable. You don't, you don't like it, okay? Yeah. Okay, good. What would you like to do about it? Back up. You, you'd like me to back up? Sure. Yeah, okay. Well, you can ask me that. And let's say, let's say I don't. In fact, I, I come a bit closer. So now what? Um... <laughs> I'm going to wonder why you're not backing up. I'm getting uncomfortable, more uncomfortable. You're going to wonder. Well, I don't give a damn what you wonder about, and I'm going to step another <laughs> step closer to you. Okay, now what? <laughs> That's very interesting that you're wondering, but that, so what? You know? Now I'm getting a little bit angry. You're getting because angry. Because you're right. not pushing back. Perfect. So what would you do then in your anger? You would. I would say to you, at this point, you have to back up and go back to your podium. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> So, in other words, what you've experienced now is healthy anger. And what healthy anger is, simply a defense of your boundaries. It just says, you're in my space, get out. That's what healthy anger is. Okay? In fact, if you look at emotions more broadly, they really have two functions. Either I want more of this, or I want less of this or I don't want this at all. So emotions invite the nurturing. I mean, there are people in your life, Beth, I'm sure, that you'd want close to you, and, and, and you might even want to bring in closer, hug them and all that. But uh, you know, in this situation, that's not what you want. You want somebody to stay out. So the role of emotions is to um, identify that which is desirable and to invite it in and that which is threatening or dangerous or unwelcome and keep it out. Okay, are you with me there? Now what's the role of the immune system? It's the same thing exactly. It's to identify that which is dangerous and unwelcome, toxic and keep it out, kill it if necessary, and to allow in what's nourishing and healthful. So the nervous system has been called the floating brain. It has the same functions of the brain. It has memory, it has learning capacity, and it is reactive to what happens. So we've identified that the role of the immune system is the same as the role of the emotional system. Now given that we've already demonstrated, or at least stated, that the two are connected, part and parcel of the same system, what do you suppose happens when you, suppose, when you suppress your emotions? Like what if Beth was suppressing her anger, like that poor woman in the obituary? She'd be suppressing her immune system, suppressing her boundaries. And then when malignancy comes along, the immune system is no longer capable of responding. And so the people who smoke and get lung cancer are the people that smoke and suppress their emotions. And the people who get lung cancer even without smoking are people who suppress their emotions even more. I'm not making this up, this is what studies show. Or what happens to anger that you suppress? Like where does it go? Where does it go? Yeah? Inside. And what, what does it do? How does, it <laughs> how, does it how does it show up? It corrodes the inside. It corrodes the inside. It turns against you, right? It turns against you. It turns against you psychologically in the form of depression. Addiction. Addiction, whatever, you know. Uh, or it turns against you in the form of autoimmune disease. Because when you've turned your emotions against yourself, you can turn your immune system against yourself. So the people that develop autoimmune illnesses are people who suppress their emotions. And they suppress their emotions because it was demanded of them in their early childhoods. So that was their adaptation.
And that's simply how it works. So, uh, we have five minutes. Uh, I'll speak a, we'll have a break in five minutes, and then after the break, I'll speak a bit longer, and we'll do some exercise together. But are there any questions right? You know what, actually, let's take the break right now for 15 minutes, and then we'll take the questions afterwards, okay? If you want to talk to me, in the meanwhile, come up and talk to me. Uh, well, just uh, while Peter, while people um, drift in, um, let's just any questions on what I've said, and then we'll continue. Yeah. So ha again, uh, hand over there, and the camera is coming to you. Hi. At the beginning of your talk, you had mentioned how disease represents um, a message for us about how we're living our life. Right. And I wonder if the same can apply to viruses that are contracted, like to HIV what? viruses. Um, like hepatitis or HIV, like can we see those contractions of viruses in the same light? Well, the, the thing about viruses is that um, they don't cause the illness by themselves. It depends on our immune response to them. So let me give you an example. There's a so-called flesh-eating disease. Um, Necrotizing fasciitis is the, is the technical name. It basically, this bacteria eats up your flesh. It's, it's life endangering. Does anybody know what causes uh, necrotizing fasciitis? Have you heard? It's the strep bacteria. But here's the thing. Strep bacteria. Here's the thing. If we swab the throat and armpits of everybody in this room, about 25-30% of people here would have the strep bacteria on their bodies. There's nobody here sitting here with flesh-eating disease. Similarly, if you take a person with the flesh-eating disease, and if you had swabbed him 10 months earlier, you would have found the same bacteria. So can we say, therefore, that the bacteria by itself caused the disease? Clearly not. Clearly what's happened is that something happened to their immune system, that the relationship between the bacteria and the individual which was symbiotic and at peace for all those years and months, all of a sudden became hostile as a result of some dip in that person's immune response. So I, I don't call the bacteria the messenger here. The, the illness is the messenger. Because the, 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 the bacteria is kind of just there. Now, sh surely um, that doesn't mean that I can be totally confident that I'm emotionally balanced and I got everything, all my ducks in a row, psychologically speaking, inject me with the HIV virus, I'll be just fine. I'm not fool enough to go there. But um, if you actually look at the HIV epidemic, and specifically in San Francisco, when I think about it, if you read Randy Shields' book, uh, The Band Plays On, um, and it, I know I'm treading here on perhaps sensitive ground, but let me just tell you how I see it. Uh, in the bathhouses of San Francisco, amongst the young gay and male population, there was indiscriminate sex happening. What was that all about? It was all about the need to be satisfied and to be accepted and to be loved. Where did that come from? That came from their childhoods. So yeah. In the HIV, there was a message, which is that you don't love yourself because you weren't allowed to. So we can look at it that way. Yeah, another hand. Uh, I was uh, recently diagnosed with mild osteoporosis. I like to say mild because okay. it makes me feel better about the whole thing. Okay. The doctor um, said it's part of the aging process. So uh -huh. I'd like to hear a little bit more about, you know, the connection with just, you know, regular aging and what you're talking about. Well, sure. That reminds me of the story of the 95-year-old who goes to the doctor and says, my knee hurts. And the doctor says, um, well, of course, sir, I mean, you don't forget, you're 95 years old, you know. And the, and the guy says, well, the other knee is 95 years old, too, but it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> And unless the doctor were to say to you that everybody at your age 
inexorably because of the ravages of time, ugly got osteoporosis, then you have to fairly ask, well, if that's not the case, then what's happening to me? So he has not answered your question. My question to you is, now, I, there was one study in the New England Journal of Medicine about osteoporosis that women, for example, who have been depressed are more likely to get osteoporosis. Why? Because depression is elevated with higher levels of cortisol. Cortisol thins the bones. So only you would know the answer to this question. Uh, you can speak to it if you wish, or just consider it for yourself if, if you wish that. But the question would be, these patterns of, that I've been describing here, these ways of being, these adaptive and later self-harming dynamics, do you recognize them in yourself? Uh, alternately, have you suppressed your feelings? What is depression actually? I mean, depression tells us what it is. The very word itself, what does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. Have you been pushing yourself down in some way? I don't know the answer to that. It's for you to ponder. But I would highly suspect that those dynamics are there. Which, and that also means that um, because they're only adaptations, they're not the real you. you. You don't have to stay with them. There's a way to get past them. We can actually redeem ourselves from our history. Okay? All right. Lots of hands, so. When you speak about suppressing um, emotions, anger, or, or, or perhaps yeah. even joy, um, what, what is the proper expression of that? Because it can alienate and endanger. It's very risky to express too much anger or even too much joy at times. Risky to what? The, the risk of alienating or, or doing damage. To who? To, to the person that you're speaking. So when you express too much joy, what's the risk? Uh, oh, well, uh, I think that people can become jealous or, uh, uh -huh. yes. They will. And, and <laughs> <laughs> when, I see, when I see a person with a lot of joy, I get jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not so, so concerned about the joy, but the, but the expression of anger. Well, look, see, here's what you ask you're asking. I mean, healthy anger is what Beth demonstrated. She said, you're in my space, get out. She but what if, you hadn't, uh, what if you hadn't moved anyway? Well, then should I get more angry with me? <laughs> you know? Um, now, in real life, of course, she could also leave. But this is a metaphor for her life, and I just wanted to know what are you going to do in your life when people are treading on your boundaries all the time. Okay? But the question that you're posing is precisely what I've been addressing here. You have your choice. Am I going to be authentic, or am I going to be attached? Am I going to sacrifice authenticity for attachment? Or will I say that the authentic self is more important than any specific attachment? And if there are people in my life who can't stand who I really am, do I really want those people in my life? Now, the child, infant, has no choice in the matter. They have no choice in the matter. The question is, do you have a choice in the matter? So, I mean, no, I'm not saying, when, when I talk about anger, I'm not talking about displays of rage and inappropriate attacks on other people and calling them names. I'm just talking about being in touch with what you're actually experiencing and not suppressing it for the sake of being accepted. How, how you express it, that's just a decision you make. But are you going to allow yourself the experience? Or are you going to suppress the experience so that you don't even vaguely threaten the attachment relationship? And there's certainly people in your life who, if you become yourself, will have difficulty with you <coughs> because they have difficulty with themselves. Yes? Do you, do you feel that uh, simply by uh, uh, recognizing that you're angry at a certain time but not saying anything is, is helpful? That's the one. Yeah, if you allow yourself the experience of it, <laughs> whether, you, what, whether what you say or what you don't say is entirely a decision. I mean, if I, to give you a ludicrous example, but if I had brought a knife here and was threatening you with it, you might feel some anger because you'd say to yourself, well, gee, I came to listen to a lecture, you know, <laughs> not to be threatened with a knife. <laughs> but as long as I have the knife in my hand, you may not wish to express the anger. <laughs> That's just a choice. 
but not to allow it, not to feel it. Oh, gee, he's the, he's the lecturer. Maybe he's got a good reason why he's threatening me tonight. You know? <laughs> you know? So yeah, OK? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes? Somebody else with that? You're speaking about a lot of the um, mistaken perceptions of allopathic medicine. And I think <coughs> another one of those is that the human being is a singular organism. Because in fact, we're actually, we have colonies of, of bacteria and, and flora in our gut oh, sure. that live in a symbiotic way <clears throat> with us and, and actually have a lot to do with our immune system and the Absolutely. way it functions. Absolutely. And um, I'm wondering how balances of our gut flora play into your picture of autoimmune diseases and, and the way that all takes place if there's yeah. some sort of okay, relationship. Look, so it's a fair question, which I'm not going to be able to answer. The reason is because I haven't studied it. The, the fact that I haven't studied it does not mean that it's not a valid investigation. I haven't studied it because a lot of people already have. And there's information about it. I study a dynamic that I think is important that's often ignored. And the only thing I would say about your question, for example, the, the, all the stuff about Candida that came out, Candida that came out some years ago and all that. I'm not in a position to really evaluate that information just because I haven't really studied it. And I, I don't deny its potential importance. Obviously, what you say is totally true, that we live in a symbiotic relationship. And it's when that symbiosis is upset that, um, or because we eat bad foods, or you know, that change the flora. I'm sure that's totally true. However, I never want to put all my eggs into that particular basket. The reason is it's an easy cop out, <coughs> because it gets us not to look at what really hurts. I mean, it's easy to talk about bacteria and diet and all that. I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong to talk about it. And again, I believe it's important. But so long as we don't use it as a way to ignore this other side of things, that's all. Okay, And it's the same with spiritual practices, too. They, they can be wonderfully life-enhancing and liberating, but they can also be a cop-out. It's what the California-based Buddhist psychologist, uh, what's his name, John? Wellwood calls spiritual bypass. So there's all kinds of bypasses. So as long as we, we look at something authentically and objectively, but we're not using it as a bypass, then I think it's important. Okay? There was a hand right in front of you there. Yeah? It's over there now? Okay, well, it's, it's your call. Yeah. Hi, Gabor. Yeah. I have a question for you. You mentioned that there's a difference between um, gut feelings, gut, gut knowing, and also intense emotional responses right. and reactions. I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about that. Right, sure, fair enough. The, um, it's not easy the distinction to make, but with practice you can make it. The gut feeling is always a response to something external. The uh, strong emotion is always a response to your interpretation of what's external. So that, and, 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 we'll, and, and that I'll demonstrate for you later on. So, but let me begin with that statement, that our gut feelings are, are precisely what um, nature has given us to orient us to what's happening out there. And the strong emotions are always generated internally in response to some belief. How they show up physically is that with the gut feeling, there's a kind of a calm knowing. Mm. With the emotion, there's a kind of an intensity. And when there's intensity there, it's always emotion that we're talking about. Th that's the major differentiation as to how to know which is which. Okay? So all this is related to suffering, but what about the fact that we're all going to die? What are you trying to tell me? Are we all going to die? <laughs> what do you mean? Sorry. Well, 
okay, yeah. So can that, can which, what which you're talking Which reminds me of my patient. What's that? Which reminds me of my patient, Mrs. Alfreda Moslinger, who was a lovely little Australian, Austri Austrian lady who would come to me. She was in her 80s, and she'd, every time she came in with anything, doctor, am I going to die? And I kept saying, no, no, Mrs. Moslinger, you're not going to die. And then one day she came in with this rash on her hand. And so I prescribed the cream. And doctor, am I going to die? And I finally I couldn't stand it. And I said, Mrs. Mosinger, you know what? You are going to die. Just not because of this, and not right now. <laughs> so I want to hear more about your question. <laughs> I think the question really has to do with, you said that you were involved with palliative care. And I had been, yeah. end of life. Yeah. So because we're going to reach that at some point, all of us, yeah. then does this also relate to whether we have a good death? And what are you calling a good death? An authentic death, I guess? I want to know what you mean by that. I mean, I, th I think you're asking an important question. I just really want to understand it. Um, I just feel as though suffering can continue all the way to the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or it can, or you cannot be in suffering. And what do you think makes the difference? Because I think you have the answer. Whether you fully experience it or not. Right. In other words, whether you resist it or not. Right. Okay. That's the answer. That right. suffering is not because of what happens. Mm -hmm. Suffering has to do with our resistance to what happens. Right. Whether yeah. we're in disease or in death. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I've seen, I, and I've seen people go both ways. Yeah. I've seen people go both ways. Me too. And, and, and sometimes, as in the experience of the Silas Seven case, sometimes the very teaching is simply acceptance. Hi. Um, this might, I think, is just maybe a further elaboration on what you just spoke to a moment ago about the, the gut um, reaction. And I, I was just wondering, and maybe you're going to get to this, but, but a, a little deeper elaboration about that relationship to the external environment, because what it brought to mind was, the, and maybe that was the distinction you were making between emotion and the actual calm response, but the the way in which the gut reaction, I'm thinking of George Bush, for example, using his gut to dismiss fact and invade Iraq, or the idea he wasn't, of... He wasn't using his gut, <laughs> he was using his distorted, traumatized emotional self. Yeah, I guess that's that's what I mean in the yeah. ways in which I think about even like Trayvon Martin or the yeah. ways that, that internalized racism or sexism, internalized belief systems, as you yeah. spoke to, shape then that sense of what we experience as our gut feeling, which aren't necessarily the gut feeling, and, and um, yeah, how we make that, that distinction. Yeah, well, the distinction has to do with the degree of intensity that's associated with the, with, with the experience. So, I mean, a person might say to you, uh, uh, my gut feeling is that you're an idiot, okay? <laughs> well, there's so much hostility in that statement. We're not talking about a gut, sta a gut feeling. We're talking about some degree of anger, you know. So with the gut feeling, with the, with the emotion, there's always significant intensity and very familiar intensity, by the way. Like so that, that's really the issue. And you can just check in with yourself. If there's a lot of intensity around that, it's not pure gut feeling. By intensity, I mean inner tension, in tense, tense in here or up here or here. Well, uh, l lots of hands. Uh, you, okay, yeah. This workshop is amazing to me. Okay, I I wrote the first ta the first part of my question because it's so many emotion so many emotions and coming out. I just share with the group and with you. Uh, due to my terrible experiences that I had as a child and I am being authentic right now by sharing that I was heavily abused in several ways, uh, sexual, emotional, physical, verbal, 
of course. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. My mother was, would take her anger out of me. And I was what some people call the invisible child. Now um, I also marry two men that were exactly the replica of my, I call him monster sometimes, biological father. Okay, now I'm by myself and I'm determined to heal. Uh, be, being given that I'm a good candidate for diabetes, hypertension, due to the stress that I had to suppress. I better suppress it or I will be abused or put down or rejected or neglected. Uh, what can I do at this point in my life to learn to heal my body properly? What's your emotion when you're asking that question? Fear. You have fear. Stay fear. Yes. You have fear. Yes. Okay. Can I trust you? Okay. You so, know? So you have fear, right? Yes. Great. So, if I told you about a person, how old are you, if you mind telling me? Oh, I'll be, I'll be 74 in August. And I'm proud that at my age. 74, you said? 74 in next coming Seven, August. Okay. And I'm proud. All right. So, l let me tell you a story. Uh, stay with the mic for a minute. Okay. Just, okay. So, let me tell you a story then, okay? Okay. So let me tell you about a 74-year-old woman, a 74-year-old woman okay. who was sexually and emotionally and physically <coughs> abused as a child, mm -hmm. has always suppressed herself, mm -hmm. had all kinds of life experiences that reinforced the early suffering, then goes to a workshop in San Francisco mm -hmm. and stands up in front of a hundred others mm -hmm. that he's, she's never met before. Exactly. And despite the fear that she has, yes. she shares about her life experience and yes. her determination to heal. Yes. What would you call that person? Courageous. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you just stay with yourself, that's all. Just keep staying with yourself. I'm shaking right now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, you, you shake for a very good reason. It's great that you're shaking. See, what trauma is, is not what happens. The trauma is not that you were sexually abused. You know what the trauma is? That you couldn't fight back or to escape. You, you couldn't fight because it was dangerous and you couldn't escape. So what your body did to keep you safe is you immobilized. You're immobilized. When animals are, this is the work of Peter Levine. I'm sure many of you know his work. Uh, when animals are, um, if you take a bear, for example, a polar bear, and you shoot him with a tranquilizing dart so you can do experiments on him. And then when he comes out of the anesthetic, he'll shake. Because this is the flight or fight response that he couldn't do. And he'll shake it out of himself. And then he just shakes it off and he goes on in his life. And he does not keep saying to himself, oh my God, what they did to me was so terrible, you know, he just shakes it off. As a child, when, when the stuff happens to you that day, you couldn't do the shaking, you couldn't do the, so they were frozen in you. So that shaking is actually all that suppressed stuff coming out of you. That's what the healing is. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions? Um, all of the uh, many, many people who are afflicted with uh, dementia and then the um, treatment uh, oftentimes, especially with those who are in facilities with antipsychotics, um, is there any hope uh, to uh, help these people who possibly have forgotten horrible things that have happened to them, I, or some of the horrible things still remain with them. Uh, can you speak about that, please? Well, the dementia is the result of lifelong suppression. I have a chapter on that in When the Body Says No. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that it can be reversed. Or that, I, or, or that I would know how to do that. What I'm suggesting is that I've seen all kinds of 
beautiful examples of how it can be lived with. When I say lived with, I don't mean just by the individual, but by the people looking after the individual. So if we weren't afraid of the dementia, if we weren't frustrated by it, if we accepted that this person, that's where they're at, if we saw what was still alive about them, which is very often playfulness, which is very often love of music, which is very often love of scrawling and drawing, which is very often um, stillness. And if we knew how to be with that and encourage it and engage with it, then the dementia would still be there, but the quality of life of the people with the dementia would be a whole lot better. So the problem is we see it as a problem to manage, and we don't put the resources into um, really creating experiences or encouraging experiences that would make that person's life even joyful. That's what I can tell you. Okay. I'll continue then. And um, since I do, I'm going to curtail my talk because I, I do want to get to the part of working with you a bit. But I'm going to play you a piece of music. Um, one of the people I wrote about in my book was um, the British cellist Jacqueline Dupre, who died with multiple sclerosis. And Jacqueline, when I looked up her biography, completely typical of everything I've been telling you. So she was one of these prodigies that was destined for greatness right from the beginning. And uh, she was going to be a cello virtuoso. The only problem is she did not want to become a cello virtuoso. But she said that if I give it up, so many people will be disappointed. What she meant by that primarily is that her parents were disappointed, particularly her mother. Jackie could never express emotions. When she played the music, though, then she could. So she, played, she expressed the emotions through the music, but it wasn't a conscious expression of emotion. It was more like a channeling of emotion that she wasn't expressing elsewhere in her life. Audiences frequently wept at her performances because the performances were so emotionally laden. And they talked about her cello voice. And she felt that, she, she wrote that when she got on stage, it's like a wall that disappeared between her and the rest of the world, that only when she was on stage was she without that wall, because then she could really be herself. And typically, even after she began to have symptoms of MS, she would deny them and just say, oh, I just fell, I hurt myself. And when she married the uh, brilliant um, Argentinian-Israeli um, pianist and conductor Daniel Barenboim, um, she molded herself to suit his expectations so much so that she even began to speak with an accent that resembled his. And her sister, Hillary, wrote about her in her biography that Jackie always had to be the Jackie that circumstances demanded. Why? Because when she was born, she was still in the maternity hospital of her mother when her mother's father died. The mother had been very close to her father, had a hard life herself, and Jackie became the surrogate parent as an infant. So she could never make a move on her own. As a matter of fact, when she was seven years old or eight, she said to her sister Hillary, Hill, don't tell our mummy this, but when I grow up, I won't be able to move or walk, which is exactly what happened. But the significant phrase here is, Hill, don't tell our mommy this. If you had a seven or eight year old daughter who had a fear that they won't be able to move or walk when they grow up, who would you want them to talk to about it? The fact is she couldn't. When she went to Russia as a teenager to study the cello, she was raped there. When she comes back to England, she says to her sister, Hill, don't tell our mommy this, but I was raped in Russia. So we're still protecting the mother. The piece I'm going to play you is uh, the beginning of the Elgar Cello Concerto, Elgar being a British composer who um, created this piece in the First World War in 1917 when he was in a state of profound depression and despondency because of the carnage. 
In fact, he wrote at the time that everything good and nice and clean and fresh and sweet is far away and never to return. He was in his seventh decade in the twilight of his years. And then the sister writes, Hillary, herself a musician, Jackie's ability to portray the emotions of a man in the autumn of his life was one of her extraordinary and inexplicable capacities. My comment is, extraordinary, yes. Inexplicable, perhaps not. Although she was unaware of it, by the time she was 20, when she recorded this piece, Jacqueline Dupre was also in the, the autumn of her life. The illness that was soon to end her musical career was only a few years, a few years away. Regret, loss, and resignation had all too abundantly been a part of her own unspoken emotional experience. She understood Elgar because she had partaken of the same suffering. His portrait always disturbed her. He had a miserable life hill, he told her sibling, and he was ill, and yet throughout it all, he had a radiant soul, and that's what I feel in his music. Who is she talking about? Herself, of course. After she died, her sister listened to a BBC recording of Jackie's last public performance in Britain. Not the performance I'll play, but a later one. A few moments of tuning, a short pause, and she began. I suddenly jumped. She was slowing the tempo down. A few more bars, and it became vividly clear. I knew exactly what was happening. Jackie, as always, was speaking through her cello. I could hear what she was saying. I could almost see tears on her face. She was saying goodbye to herself, playing her own requiem. Now, the piece I'll play, however, is the recording that she made at age 20. There are many beautiful recordings of this piece of music, none so poignant, in my view, than as uh, Jack and Dupre's. And I'll play just a few minutes of it. And so, Claire, right now. Just a bit more volume. Um, it's the cello concerto of Edward Elgar, E-L-G-E-G-A-R, performed by Jacqueline Dupre, D-U, capital P-R-E, conducted by, I think, Sir Adrian Bolt, or maybe, no, somebody else. Anyway, it's on EMI. So there's much more I could tell you, but I mean, it, it would only be to further illustrate the same point. So I think what I'd rather do is just to begin a little bit of work with you uh, to see how this shows up in your life, okay? And so the first question I'm going to ask, and what I request you do basically is um, just divide yourself into partners, so just the whoever's sitting next to you, okay? And you'll be having a conversation. Okay, so just settle that first, okay? Make sure you got a partner, okay? If you don't have a partner, find one. Or as uh, Elvis Presley sings in Jailhouse Rock, what's the word? If you don't have a partner, use a wooden chair. <laughs> but find a partner, and if, 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 if there's not partners, then you can do it in a three, like, but, okay? Uh, anybody in, without a partner at the moment? You're all good, okay? So um, we're going to give this 
three minutes in each side, and I'll just yell out at the end of three minutes. So um, the question is going to be, partner B, you decide who, is going to ask partner A a question, and then partner A will just ponder the question, answer it, when nothing else comes up, they'll go back and think about it some more, get in touch with their bodies, and whatever else comes up, they'll report that. Partner B, who asked the question, does not respond. Oh yeah, I get that, I'm the same way. Or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a conversation, it's a, it's a witnessed uh, soliloquy, okay? So you're talking, and so the partner B's role in this part is to fully get what A is saying. Then in three minutes, we're going to switch it around exactly. Okay? The question you'll be asking one another is, tell me where in your life you are not saying no. And by that I mean where, where there's a no there that wants to be said. Because I mean the whole point of this teaching here is that when you don't say no, your body will say it. Which is what the illness is. So, where in your life are you not saying no? That happens in two major areas, not surprisingly, in the realm of personal relationships and in work. Okay, so look at those areas in your life. Where in your life are you not saying no? Again, where sometimes you, there's no, sometimes you don't want to say no. Sometimes there's no good reason to say no. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when there's a no that wants to be said, but you don't say it. Okay? Any, any questions on the question? Okay? If it's really clear to you, it's all clear, yeah? Then partner B, please ask your question, and partner A, begin to answer. Okay? Okay, let's come back. So, now we're going to continue, but um, no, no longer pairing up because simply we'll run out of time. So the uh, question that many of you have is, what can we do about all this stuff? Well, one of the things you can do about it is once a day you can sit down and ask yourself, where, have I, where, where did I not say no today? So become conscious of it. And you do so not with self criticism or uh, some kind of an attack on the self that sure I was such an idiot I didn't say no why didn't I say no notice the difference you can say why didn't I say no is that a question what is it it's a statement and the statement is I'm a bad person or you can say gee I wonder why I didn't say no well, that's the question. Okay? So don't do it with that first, but do it with the second attitude. Just write down. We, we, you know, do it once a week if you want, once a day. I mean, it depends how important this work is to you, but where didn't I say no? Where there was a no that I didn't say it. Okay? So um, the second question I'm going to ask you now, and I'll just ask for people to put their hands up and volunteer, volunteer whatever comes up for you is whether it's in personal relationship or whether it's at work or wherever it is, you don't say no, what is the impact on you of not saying no? What is the impact on you physically? What is the impact on you emotionally? And finally, what is the impact on your relationship to others when you don't say no? Okay? So let's start with somebody who's willing to talk about it a bit, okay, anybody? Okay, great, a hand over there, if you don't mind. So, and your name is? Barbara. Barbara, thank you. And so, if you just say, we're not gonna, not gonna ask you what precisely, but in what area did you identify that your greatest difficulty saying no? Work. At work, okay. What is the impact on you of not saying no? Burnout. Burnout, which means? Which means Unable to be present. I'm a psychotherapist, so unable yeah. to be present for myself, therefore unable to be present with my patients. <coughs> Do you notice? That's fine. I'm sure it's true. But just say a bit more. About, I'm sorry. This just to be a, <laughs> an, an invisible shield. Is it? Remember the invisible shield on those commercials? Yeah. Um, 
So just say a bit more about that. Unable to be present for yourself and therefore for your clients. What do you mean by that? So what I mean by that is that I, I'm not connected to my, my own body and being. I'm somewhere else. You're somewhere else right now. Ah, am I intellectualizing? Are I'm you asking good. or telling I'm me? I'm very good at that. Yeah, I see that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so just get present. What is the impact? I'm having a hard time finding the words for it, but I, w I know what I experienced last month. Never mind last month. What are you experiencing right now? And in this very moment, I'm, experience I'm actually experiencing quite a bit of calm. Calm, okay. Um, I'm also experiencing, I'm feeling my body connected to the chair. Okay. Pretty intensely. Okay. However, I'm also, as I'm thinking about sort of the work piece, there's the fear that comes up, which is the financial fear. Well, the, the fear is why you don't say no, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not the impact of not saying no. Um, that's maybe the cause of not saying no. So tell me more about the impact of not saying no. Uh, the impact of not saying no is um, the physical stress that it puts on my body. But Barbara, you're analyzing. Well, I was trained here at this very school to do that. <laughs> <laughs> then there's something missing in your training. Perhaps. I mean, I mean, you analyze, by the way, by the way, you were not trained by this very school to, school to do that. Mm. You've done it all your life. Mm -hmm. Have you not? Right, right. You came to the school because you wanted to keep doing what you were doing. Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you for the validation. Yeah. Now, uh, the impact, I, I understand, it's not that what you're saying is not true, but it's analytical. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't say, mm -hmm. I'm experiencing the impact of, you know, uh, stress. What is the body saying? It says it in the form of heartburn, uh, stomach ache, uh, oh. tension, uh, muscle tightness, fatigue, sleeplessness, dry mouth. Uh, inability to sleep, uh, headaches, he headaches, any number of manifestations. So, so, so what is your body saying? The uh, digestion gets impacted and... Oh boy. So you're, still, you're still analyzing. I know. Okay, so, 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 so should I just get really crude then? Crude? Yeah. What Around like what, what happens what, to my body. What do you call crude, by the way? <laughs> like saying the big F-bomb. Yeah. Uh, just say what happens, if you're willing to. Uh -huh. If it's not comfortable, please don't. I mean, don't, you can say no to me too. E you can yeah. say, I don't want this conversation. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I have a tendency to get constipated. You get constipated, right? Uh, my th throat closes. Right. To then, s uh, in the inability to vocalize and speak. Okay. Um, I okay. get a lot of tension in my neck and right. Uh, sinuses. Right. Right. My tongue dries up. Mm -hmm. My libido shrinks. Mm -hmm. My palms get sweaty. Okay. My feet get cold. You get cold feet, huh? <laughs> what else do I experience? Uh, my hair can have a tendency to get really brittle okay. and dry. Yeah. I, I, my ears tend to build up with wax or so. And under my fingernails, I noticed during that, those times, 
under my fingernails it gets there's more of a build up okay so the theme seems to be blockage right the mm -hmm. theme is blockage yeah 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 especially here great thank you that was Impressive work. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping me get Yeah, time. yeah. Um, but um, okay, let's let's take somebody else, and uh, I'm not going to keep. Here's a question I'm going to ask you now. Okay, so what is the impact? So this is a very eloquent depiction of the impacts of of not saying no. So remember that article I read you where the the ways we adapt to our early environment then become source of problems later on. This is a total, um, uh, totally clear example of that. And I'm pretty sure that if uh, we spoke about your childhood, we could identify exactly, and, and you probably already have, you know, what exactly happened to, to, to do that. Now, however, your um, statement, and perhaps if, if the mic can go back to Barbara for a moment. If I asked you why, what is the story behind your inability to say no? Uh, how come you can't? And your response was fear of a financial fear. Okay, that's what you said, right? Is there anything else about, about that? Like, why else can't you say no? What is the reason you can't say no? That's, that's the next question. First question is, where am I not saying no? Second, what is the impact? And by the way, uh, you know, you told me the impacts on yourself. What, what, you, you talk about the physical impacts. What is the emotional impact mm. on you? Oh, complete irritability. Irritability, right? And what is the impact on your relationships? Well, I have to ask my husband. No, I'm asking you. <laughs> oh, it's, I have a tendency to then isolate because I don't want to be irritable. So that I person. isolate. Okay. So then it's, then I'm not, interacting and connecting with the people who I want to be. Right, so notice what the absolute irony of it. Mm. You adapted these dynamics in order to stay attached. In order to stay attached to your, to your care, caregiving as a, environment as a child, you learn to suppress yourself and mm -hmm. to suppress your no. Of course. The impact, so that helped you then. It helped you stay attached. What's it doing to your attachment now? It's not. It's getting in the way of it. <clears throat> right. It's isolating you. So even on the level of attachment, it's getting you the very opposite of what you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could ask your husband, I'm not going to know, or what is the impact on him, you know, but, mm -hmm. but that's the impact on you. Okay, so whether on the physical, emotional, or relational level, even on a relational level, it never gets us what we want. And by the way, even if we, it gave you what you wanted, like let's say, Barbara had also identified difficulty saying no to her husband in some ways. And uh, in order to maintain the attachment relationship, even if she got what she wanted, or let me put it more broadly, even if we get what we want, if we suppress ourselves, and, and what we want is, please just love me, so I'm gonna suppress myself so you love me, that's basically the idea. And even if they loved us, they still wouldn't. And even if they loved us, we still wouldn't feel loved. Why wouldn't we feel loved? What's that? We're not our authentic self. Because we're not our authentic self. And something in you, in you would still be completely insecure about it. Mm -hmm. And would say, am I being loved for how I'm showing up for them? Or am I being loved for who I actually really am? And if you're not being loved for who you actually really are, then it doesn't matter what contortions you go through to make yourself loved, you will never will feel, feel loved in your life. And that's why these people who die young are so lonely mm. in the midst of 500 mourners because they're never seen for their true selves, but they never revealed their true selves because when they did as children, they weren't accepted. Yeah. It's no mistake that, that this is happening at this very moment okay. because I was driving in my car the other day and I was, this little bubble was coming up around all of this, okay. right outside of my consciousness. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting and I want to know more about it. 
So thank you for. Okay. No, well, thank you. All right. Well, uh, if I was doing a day-long workshops, we'd go much more depth. But all I can do here in a space of three hours is to illustrate the point for you. But that's the work. When am I not saying no? What is the impact? And what is no? Yeah. And the next question is, what is the story behind it? So let's find somebody else who's willing to talk about that. Okay. Is that you? Yeah. You in your work in Canada and here, do you see hope uh, in, in a general societal sense about parental teaching about the first three years of life? I mean, do, do you have a lot of company uh, in, in, your, in your work? Uh, do you think that we're improving or, or because of capitalism we're... <laughs> well, listen, I, I make a living because the world is so stupid. I mean, don't, don't spoil a good thing here for me, okay? <laughs> If this society ever got a bit of consciousness, I'd be out of job. <laughs> you know, I don't. There's no. There's no threat to my livelihood right now. Um, look, um, I'm not alone in this. Um, I have great teachers. The Almas, uh, who I was in San Francisco this weekend, who, I, who I've never met. A L M A A S. A L M A A S. He was in here at a conference this weekend, I think. Yeah. And uh, well, it was last weekend. Okay. This Friday. This, this Friday. Friday. You hosted it. Yeah. yeah we did. It was as part of the yoga and psychic conference. Yeah. I'd love to meet the guy someday. I have never yet. But anyway, so he's saying it. Other great teachers are saying it. Um, uh, lots, of be, lots of work being done on brain development now and how the early emotional environment shapes the development of the brain. And when it's nurturing, the brain develops properly. And when it isn't, we get distortions. You know. I've written several books myself. I don't know if you've read any of them, but uh, the one on parenting, Hold On To Your Kids, the brilliant psychologist called Gordon Neufeld about uh, the attachment being the basis of healthy development. Other people are saying it. So there's a much more awareness of this now, but in, if you're asking on a societal level, it's going the other way. So there's, a, there's sort of a dialectic here. The worse it gets, the more consciousness some people are getting and the more the new message, if it's new at all, is, com is coming out. But on the broad societal level, boy, we're in the disaster zone. Um, and why? Because the part of us that loves more than anything else is going to go to a lot of trouble to wake us up. It's going to create great suffering to wake us up. That works on a societal level as well. And there's powerful forces that don't want to wake up because they l exist on people being uh, in a state of somnambulism, uh, walking, sleep. So, uh, but I don't, let me ask you, what's behind that question for you? Oh, just wanting to feel, uh, feel hopeful, wanting to, uh, wanting to prevent some of the suffering that, that goes on yeah, if we can't you, to reduce can't, suffering. But you can't look for that hope outside of yourself. That's the root of despair. No. The, the, you know, it, it, on a societal level, I mean, look, what am I supposed to say when Fisher Price comes up with a new toy, a, a new baby seat, which has got an iPad embedded in it <laughs> for one-year-olds. I mean, where is it going? So hope is not going to... What, what we can say is that more people are waking up, and as long as we wake up, we can also accept how things are in order to be with how things are so that we can work with it. So the hope is never outside of ourselves. And, and one, one more thing, if, uh, you know, during this, this crucial three years, say, a, the, a parent dies and one parent is left with this great grief, but in raising a child, do you, do you sometimes see people who are able to not, not be harmed in that situation? Because that, that's something that is sure, not preventable. Sure, but that depends yeah. on what support is around. So if, if a parent dies and the other parent is completely alone and devastated, that kid is in deep trouble. That parent is going to, that child is going to become the parent. But if that family is surrounded by a community, if they're friends, look, I'm going to uh, Calgary in two weeks where a friend of mine who 12 years ago was diagnosed with breast cancer and typical history of childhood abuse and all that, and she fought it off. She didn't fight it off. She lived through it and she got in touch with herself. And now she's developed lung cancer as a result of the radiation that she got for the breast cancer. And meanwhile, her 16-year-old daughter was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And, I'll be, and, and my friend is losing weight now, and she's really coming to the end. She didn't know whether she would die before or after her daughter. 
But that family is surrounded by so much love, so many friends. I'm going there because an event has been organized and raise money. People are taking them food, and I, those kids are with friends all the time. I mean, adult friends. So there's only one kid that's going to um, there's only one kid that's going to live through this, and that's the youngest brother, who's now 14 or 15 years old. And the mother has already prepared. She, he, she's asked me. The kid doesn't even know me. Met me once when he was very small. But the mother has asked me and others to video the messages for the boy. They'll be played for him when he's 18 or 21 and so on. That kid will be fine. So it depends very much on the support system. Okay. I just wanted to share something about healing. About? Healing. Yeah. Um, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. I was sexually abused by my father, possibly from babyhood or toddlerhood through age four, and there were years of emotional abuse. Right. And um, I've had symptoms of PTSD all my life, though I'm not formally diagnosed. But just a few weeks ago, as I was applying for a promotion at work, I woke up with this, this weird um, activity in my crown chakra, and one of my problems with the PTSD has been memory loss. <coughs> I take a lot of notes at work. I felt this weird, like, activity. I didn't know if it was something being released through there, but it was something energetic. That morning, when I got to work, I could remember things. Mm. So it was really amazing. And mm. last September is when my sleeplessness, my insomnia that I've had <laughs> most of my life, that disappeared too. So okay. healing you know, is and possible. And you want me to teach you about healing? What? I didn't hear and you, you want me to teach you about healing? No. No, you're not. Okay. I just want to share this with the others. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I so much appreciate it. Yeah. In my life, I have a great disconnect between some symptoms that happen to me on nearly a, a daily basis of waking with dread and nausea and migraine headaches. Right. And yet, I can't make that connection somehow. I know... Connection to? To the childhood. Okay. I can make it somehow, I believe that it is part of my life and it, it has something to tell me, but I don't know what that is. And I don't really understand how to get from the point that I believe that's true to knowing um, what it can tell me. Okay. So you saw the process we, we went through with uh, Clara, right? Yes. Okay. Did you get anything from that? Some. Well, yeah. stay, with, stay with the mic. Okay. Where Some. Did, where did you get from that? Um, but it, I projected it onto her, so I didn't really feel it in my gut. Okay, but what, if anything, did you get? That things that you, ways that you coped when you were young also are ways that you cope now. Okay, that's, part of, that's one of the lessons, yeah. Uh, the other one is, do you ever get upset? Not very often. Ever get upset? Probably never. Okay. Yeah. Then, then what I would say to you is that um, I, with all due respect, I can't answer your question now. Uh-huh. Um, and the reason I can't is because uh, I'd have to really work with you. Sure. And I, I don't have the time anymore to do that. I understand. I'm having another event this afternoon. Um, um, let me tell you something, something that I do and something you may wish to explore for yourself. That kind of deep disconnect actually speaks to the degree of trauma that you experienced. It's the very sign of it. Mm -hmm. Even though you don't have any way to remember, or, or, or I should say, recollect what happened to you, or to understand what happened to you, but it's in you. True. And it's showing up in your symptoms, it's showing up in your very not recalling. It's showing up in that very disconnected self, because the disconnected self is the coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. 
Okay? And the never getting upset is a clear giveaway of just how suppressed you were. Right. Okay? So that's a memory too. But how to get it out so that you can actually be, like Jesus says, that which you shall bring out of you will save you. Mm -hmm. And um, so how to get it out? Well, I, I don't know what kind of work you've done. Have you done psychotherapy? Some. Much? Some. Yeah. Well, maybe some more is in order. <laughs> I mean, in, other words, in other words, you're going to have to take charge here. Right. You're going to take responsibility that here's how it is right now. And I'm paying a cost that I'm not willing to keep paying, if I can possibly help it. Mm -hmm. But that's going to take some active decisions on my part to get help. Which, by the way, is not easy for me because I'm one of these people that thinks they can do it all by themselves. True. Right? Yes. Because that's how I survived. That's a memory, too. Yeah. So, therefore, I'm going to get some psychotherapy. I'm going to see somebody who does body work mm -hmm. so I can release what I'm holding in my body. I might even work with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. I do that. I lead retreats with it twice a year. If you came to one of my retreats, I'd, be, I'd believe me, it would crack you open within a week. Yeah. You know, that, that's not, I'm not saying it's for everybody. I'm just saying that there's lots of roots. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to just search it now. You're going to have to make a decision. Is this important enough to me that this question that I just asked is not just an intellectual question at a seminar, but actually a life question that I want to engage with? And if it is, then you'll do it. Right. And you'll find it. It'll come to you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. What is ayahuasca? Well, you might ask. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a plant from the Amazon that it makes a tea that you drink, and it tastes awful, and it makes you puke. That's what it is. Okay? Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it, it, also, um, it also gives you deep insight and visions that tell you about your reality. It's nothing that you do on your own. You do it in the proper ceremony. It's a ceremony developed by the shamans in the Amazon. I don't lead the ceremonies. I lead the retreats. People I work with who are trained that way lead the ceremonies. There's chanting at night. There's the drink. There's the experience. Then there's the preparation and the processing of the experience afterwards. And it's like 10 years of psychotherapy in a week. Uh, but uh, it's not for everybody. I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying it is, it is out there. There are local ceremonies as well. There's people who do ceremonies here in San Francisco and in, in this area, really good people. They can be very healing. They don't have the retreat format that, that I help to facilitate, so there's not this work around it. But imagine this kind of work done over a week with 25 people all of whom also share three ceremonies and all that psychic and emotional opening that happens in ceremony. It can be very frightening, very difficult. I don't care. It's not about is it beautiful, is it frightening. It's all about what is being learned. So in a nutshell, that's what it is. And there's a documentary that you can watch on YouTube um, on my work with Ayahuasca. And um, I forget the title because it's, well, you know, maybe I can, he can maybe tell it to you. Hold on a second. If you want to watch it, mm -hmm. websites, let's see here. Yeah, here it is. So you go to YouTube, and it's a Portuguese title. But you know what? So I'll, I'll bring up this document. Anybody who wants to can write on the URL afterwards. I'm not going to read it out to you now. It's too complicated. And you can just watch the documentary. You can also Google me and Ayahuasca, and you can hear a lecture that I gave here in San Jose, California last year at a conference. Okay? So you can learn all about it. How is it spelled? A-Y-A-H-U-A-S-C-A. -A There's tremendous information out there about it. And again, what I have to emphasize, it has to be done in the right context, under the right guidance. Okay? And it's not for everybody. Okay, other tearing? Yes. Okay, Clara, yeah. So you, you, got the, you got it where you're not saying no. You got the impact. Why aren't you saying no? Because I feel like, so for me, it's at work. I have yeah. a lot of chronic pain yeah. due to, well, partly that showed up around being on a computer all the time. So wrist, elbow, and now shoulder to where I have frozen shoulder. But I feel like doing the work that I do allows me to be in the CIS community. 
which feels like my home, and if I didn't have this job, there's a lot I love about the job, and it keeps me here as part of the community, and it's underwriting my PhD. So it's a heavy... So the story, the story is that um, I don't say no because I want, to, I want to be part of the community. Yeah, I guess. I mean, to say no, I don't know how I would have the job. So to say no means exile, excommunicate, I mean... Yeah, so what you're saying is if I say no, I won't be part of the community. Right. Fair enough? Right. <laughs> how new is that? How new? Yeah. I mean, what was your story as a kid? Yeah, uh, it's, it's sort of mysterious to me. I had what's, what I conceive of as very nurturing parents. I had a really nurturing mom. I breastfed. I was accepted for who I was. I felt like... Um, Terrific. You're great for me. Thanks very much. <laughs> I love this kind of example. I'm your example. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. you're welcome. No. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering. Um, so, um, tell me a little bit about your. I mean, do you mind doing this work? No, no. Okay. So, tell me a little bit about your family then. Um, I have one older brother. Um, my mom's a therapist. Tell me about your childhood in that family. Is what I mean. My childhood. Yeah. Um, Let's see, I guess there's a lot of contrast between my brother and I. He was um, always quite emotive, uh, very easily expressed emotion, easily expressed like, I love you. When I would get hurt or embarrassed, I would run to a closet or want to be not seen. Perfect. But you had wonderful nurturing parents and a great childhood. Yes. <laughs> but when you were hurt, you ran into a closet. Right. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? I, I, m well, my assumption was that I was overly attended to and I was trying to... That's, okay, yeah, yeah, so I, I just imagine a one and a half year old was hurt. Yeah. And she's saying to herself, gosh, I, I wish I could get some help right here, mm -hmm. but I think I'm being overly attended to. Mm -hmm. One and a half year old? <laughs> right, yeah, I don't, ha I don't remember that. Of course you don't. Young, yeah. Well, you know what, you do remember it. You just don't recall it. Right. Uh, here's the story. You have children? No. If you had a five-year-old who felt hurt or scared or whatever, what would you want her to do? Come to me. Come to you? Yeah. If you had a five-year-old and you found out that this kid felt hurt, scared, whatever, and she didn't come to you, how would you understand that? I'd wonder what was wrong with me. Why didn't I make her feel secure or safe? Well, you, that's the right question, but the, how would you, but, but, the, but, but, but what you'd have to understand is this kid does not feel safe with me. Mm -hmm. This kid does not feel that I'm here, that I can be trusted to take care of her. Mm -hmm. Now, what is her experience when she can't go to mommy uh, with fear or hurt? Mm -hmm. What is her experience? It will hurt mom too much. No, no, that's her thought, mm. maybe. What is her actual experience? What is she feeling? S lonely. Lonely. And sad. Sad. Mm. Frightened. Frightened. Angry. Angry. Right. That was your childhood. Sure doesn't feel like that. <laughs> I mean. Well, I mean, yeah. uh, okay, all right. Maybe you were the one kid in the history of the universe. No, I'm not. I'm not saying it isn't the case. I'm saying. You say that your feelings don't match up with that. Yes, I'm just saying that. Sure, sure. I'm, okay, but look, here's the thing. Yeah. It 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 doesn't. There's a, there's a reason why it doesn't feel like that. Right. And the reason is is that, what would you have done if you had allowed your feelings to feel your feelings? Then what would you, what would your situation have been then? Mm, having to be responsible. I mean, I guess what's coming to me is having to be responsible f not only for my own pain and fear, but also for... Well, actually, you would have been in a state of impossible emotional mm -hmm. 
uh, distress. Mm -hmm. You could not allow yourself to feel those feelings because you were so alone with them. Mm -hmm. So you suppress them. And that's why you don't recall them. So you see, it doesn't feel like it. Right. But just imagine any right. child for a moment cowering in a closet for fear of letting her emotions out. Mm -hmm. Just what do you feel when you look at that child? Well, I guess a couple things are coming up. Yeah, that's sad. Um, okay. And I believe that it's the case. I guess the place I'm at now is how do I even reconcile my intellectually believing this, yeah. but tapping into the actual somatic knowing of that and believing it. Sure, okay. Uh, well, this is the next exercise I was going to do. Let's do it with you, okay? Do you ever get upset with anybody in your life? Yeah. Okay, tell me the last time you were upset with somebody. Um, By the way, this is for all of you, okay? <laughs> Barb, or, or Carla is just being the brave volunteer. Okay, um, so when was the last time you were upset with somebody? Yeah, okay, so probably someone I lived with. So, so what's that? Someone, I, someone who I live with. Someone you live with? Yes. What happened? Um, Can I get a piece of paper, please? Uh, carry on. Okay. Um, I brought up an issue around cleaning. You, you brought up an issue? An issue around cleaning, cleaning, cleaning the house. What, uh, just, you know, just actually say what happened. Specifically? You, okay. said, you said, they said. Okay. Right. You said. Um, okay, so I would have said, hmm, I, I've noticed that there seems to be a film of grease on the dishes quite often. I know that we all need to, you know, sort of be mindful of using soap or using hot water. Let's just all notice how, you know, we're cleaning the dishes. Oh boy. Something to that effect. <laughs> yeah. Can we be mindful of making sure that, we, that the dishes are clean once we put them in the dish Let me tray? tell you something right away. Yeah. If you were the only other person in the world, I wouldn't want to live with you. Okay. <laughs> ba based, on, based on what you just said, uh -huh, okay? okay? Uh -huh. But I'll let that pass for the moment. Okay. I'll, tell you in a while. I'll tell you in a moment. Are you okay with this game? Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, I asked great. for yeah. it. Okay, great. Uh, I brought you here. But, uh, okay, so you, you said, hmm, uh, you know, uh, right, this is about as snarky and super silly as it gets. Mm -hmm. but, but, and, and indirect, too. Mm -hmm. Direct would be clean the damn dishes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. But anyway, what did they say? Huh, I thought I was cleaning them well. Huh, I thought I was cleaning them well, okay? <laughs> and your emotional response was? What did you feel? What's your emotional reaction? Um, well, I live with multiple people, so it was like, well, maybe it's not this person, maybe it's another person. So it's like, I'm going to wait and see. I'm sorry. When this person said, mm -hmm. I thought I was cleaning them. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you weren't talking about that particular person. But, well, I live with multiple people. And, and the person who you were talking directly about talking to wasn't the one who responded. Is that what you're saying? No, she she did respond, and my I guess my sense in the immediate moment was relief. What did the person say about whom you were talking? The person said, um, "Huh, I haven't really noticed that." I haven't noticed that. Okay. Mm -hmm. What did you feel? Um. I felt a sense of tentative relief because I had brought wait, the issue wait, wait, up. Wait, wait, wait. We're talking about an upset here. Okay. I asked you when was the last thing you were upset with somebody. You're talking about relief. Well, what was uh, the upset? The upset was. What was the emotion? <laughs> uh, what was the, what, what were the feelings that you had? Um, well, I guess th the feelings are resentment that things. N not that. Resentment. Resentment. Yeah. Which is another word for anger, by the way. Right. Anger. Now, first of all, do you notice how difficult it is for you to get to the feeling? Mm. You start mm -hmm. talking about tentative relief and mm -hmm. all. What, what does it even mean to have tentative? What, do what does it mean to have tentative relief? I mean, mm -hmm. you have relief or you don't have relief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> Look, tentative in that maybe the situation no, no, will change. No, stay with me. Okay. Stay with me. This difficulty getting to your feelings is the memory of your childhood. Mm -hmm. Okay? But then you identify there's the anger there. Any other emotions there besides anger? I 
I guess self-pity. Notice the phrasing, I guess. Yeah. I, I, this, I, is, this is the, again, this is the memory of your childhood. Mm -hmm. You distance yourself. So now you have to guess what your feelings actually are. I do. But self-pity, what's another word for self-pity? Because self-pity is an analysis. Mm -hmm. It's not a feeling. Um, compassion for oneself? No, no, no. <laughs> compassion is not the same as self-pity. No, let, let this person do her own work, okay? <laughs> Don't um, rescue her. Sadness for sadness. myself? Thank you. There's yeah. anger, and hurt, anger and sadness, right? Any tinge of hurt? Just ask. Yeah, me. yeah, sure. Okay. Anger, sadness, and hurt. Got it? Mm hmm Right. Now let me ask you, what did you feel anger and sadness and hurt about? As a child, you mean? No, no. In what? this incident that we're talking about. Mm. Um. Yeah, I guess I, I picked sort of a benign example, which maybe wasn't accidental. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking this about... Is, this, this is the perfect example. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm asking you, what did you feel anger heard, heard and sad about? Um, that, I guess, my contributions or my level of comfort in the home or my needs aren't noticed. Your needs aren't noticed. Or respected. Your needs are not noticed or respected. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to ask other people in the room here to help us out for a moment, and then we'll come back to you. OK? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to pass the mic around because there's no time for it. But for those of you that might possibly uh, have an explanation for why this other person said what they said without that having anything to do with not respecting or noticing uh, Clara's needs or feelings. So why might this other person have responded the way they did that has nothing to do with them not respecting or, or, or accepting um, seeing Clara's needs, okay? Any other possible explanation? We're not, gonna, we're not saying which is right, by the way, you understand? We're just looking for possible explanations for what happened, okay? So this is what, this is what happened. Then is your emotional reaction. Then is your uh, belief that this means that I'm not being respected and my needs aren't being seen. Let's see if there's any other possible explanations, okay? Yes? Uh, I would feel attacked if someone spoke to me. So perhaps the person felt attacked when you, said, when you spoke the way you spoke, mm -hmm. okay? Can you see that as a possibility? Sure. Yeah, what else? That person doesn't know what her needs are. That person doesn't know what your needs are. Okay? And uh, that, yes? They don't know how upset she is. They don't actually get how upset you feel. Okay? Yes? They're okay with the dishes the way they are. They're okay with the dishes exactly the way they are. <laughs> okay? One more, perhaps. Yeah? They didn't notice her. They didn't notice uh, what upset her. They didn't know what upset you. Okay, one more. They didn't trust that what she was saying was really what she meant, so an authenticity. Maybe they didn't quite get what you were saying or didn't trust where you were coming from, perhaps, um, because of the way you speak, because of the indirectness in your speech. And I'll give you one more. Maybe you trained them not to notice your needs. Okay? Now, let, you hear all these possible explanations. Yeah. So there's eight, nine different explanations here. Are you with me? Yes. That potentially explain why person X said what they said. Yeah. Then there's your explanation, which is that they don't respect or see my needs. Mm -hmm. Okay? Which of those is most hurtful to you? My version. Your version. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let's notice something. See, this is all about the fact that you don't think you remember your childhood. Mm -hmm. Okay? So stay with me here, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's notice something. There were 10 possible explanations. You chose the worst possible one. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. That's the first point. The second point is, you didn't choose it. 
Because it's not like you went through all these other 10 and you asked yourself, well, which could be true here? Oh, it must be this one. It was totally automatic, right? You see that too? How automatic it was? That's the second point. The third point is that you didn't react to what happened. What did you react to? You acted to your interpretation of what happened. Do you see that? That's the third point. And that's why I said earlier, we're never upset about what we're upset about. Now the question is, why, and, and, and by the way, Clara, you're not any different from me. You're not any different from anybody else here. This is how it goes. That's the whole point. That's why your volunteering is such a gift. But here's how it goes. The question is now, why? Why does this happen? Why does the mind automatically go to the worst possible explanation? And why, you know, it's because that's your memory of your childhood. You're not in your present. You're not in the present. You're in the past. Remember I said in the beginning that the thing is to redeem ourselves from our history. Now, your sense of your needs not being respected is seen is precisely your childhood. Can you see that? That's why you ran into the closet. Okay? Now, you think you don't remember it? You do. It shows up in your life every day. It shows up in the fact that you're afraid that you're going to lose your community if you authentically state what, you need, what your needs are. That if you said to this community here, this evolved, enlightened, spiritually minded, therapeutically based, <laughs> evolving consciousness. It's very ironic. Community. And, 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 and if you said to these people that actually my body is saying no to what I'm doing right now and I'm so afraid of losing contact with you, I'm actually suppressing myself. Is that the present or is that what you did as a kid? That's the memory. So that, and, then, and, and here's the point and then we're going to have to end this session. I'll take time for questions if you want. Is we have two kinds of memory. There's the, the explicit memory which is recall. You can't call back, recall is what you call back, you can't call back any experiences of these emotions. You can't recall them. But the recall, and you think therefore it's not the reality. But recall memory is only one kind of memory. In fact, it's the weakest kind of memory. A much more powerful memory is what's called implicit memory. An implicit memory is the emotional experiences embedded in your psyche and in your brain that come up in the present, but you don't see them as memories. You think you're reacting to the present. That's what an implicit memory is. So it's not true, Clara, that you don't remember your childhood. Every day you remember your childhood. The very fact that you can't say no, because otherwise you think you'll lose attachment, is a memory. The very fact that you think that if you lose attachment, even if it was true, even if it was true that if you expressed your needs, you would lose this job, even if that was true, I don't know if it's true or not, even if it was, if you didn't perceive yourself as a still as a child who was dependent on attachment, in other words, if you saw your needs, who's the one who has to see your needs here? Who doesn't see your needs? Who's the one? Me. It's you. Do you get that? If you saw your needs, it wouldn't matter if anybody else did or not. And if you saw your needs, you'd attack people into your life who also saw your needs. But the very suppression of your needs is the memory. And then the emotions that you experience when somebody else doesn't see your needs or you perceive that they don't, that's your childhood memory. It's not true that you don't remember. You just have to recognize the memory for what it is as memory. Are you with me? Any questions? Why did you look at your watch? <laughs> Why did you look at your watch? I looked at my watch because I'm in a dual role of hosting the workshop also, so I have to see the time. You can't step out of the role for a second, can you? Yeah. You can't step out of the role. It's hard. I see that. Yeah. And look, I know that too. So this is not an accusation. Yeah. I just want you to notice. Okay? Remember what I said in the beginning? That one of the risk factors of illness is rigid and compulsive identification with duty, role, and responsibility? Mm -hmm. 
This is how hard it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Nothing that I can formulate or articulate right now. Okay, well, here's what I suggest you do then. Do this exercise with the no. What, you know, what's the impact? What's the story behind it? And every time you get upset, sit down and go through this exercise of what happened. <coughs> what happened is what I said, what they said. Not that they were arrogant. That's not what happened. What happened is that they said something. And what happened? What was my emotional, re what was my emotional reaction? What was my interpretation? What are the possible interpretations? And your invitation will always, is always going to be a memory of your childhood. OK? OK. OK. Yeah, that's as much as I can teach you in three hours. Now, uh, I know some of you may have to leave. Uh, those of you that wish to stay, if I ask for questions. First of all, let's just have those people that have to leave right now just leave, OK? Just take a minute to do that. And thank you very much for coming, all of you. Thank you. So we'll allow people to leave, and then those that wish to stay and ask questions, we'll do that, OK? Is that okay if you stay a few minutes to ask questions? That's fine. Yeah. Okay, questions? Yeah. So the mic will come to you. Um, what is your definition of the psyche? Of the psyche? Uh, just can you stay with the mic? What do you understand it when I say the word psyche? What? What do you understand when I say that word? Well, I'm always thinking of the Jungian definition in, so, in the so, root so, of so, the so word. So what do you understand by it? Um, it's sort of like a living plant of energy that blossoms within the individual. OK. That's not what I mean. So what I, thanks uh -huh. for asking. So what I mean is um, it's um, words are just words, right? And um, when I talk about the psycho and neuroimmunology, when I talk about the relationship between psyche and body, I'm talking about um, our emotional existence, conscious or unconscious, mostly unconscious, actually. OK? So that our body is responding to our unconscious beliefs and uh, unexpressed emotions. Yeah. I feel I have to be a perfectionist due to adaptation. Yeah. Okay. How at this stage in my life can I learn to recognize where I'm coming from? Is it my well, well, look, first of all, you said you feel like I have to be a perfectionist. That's not a okay. feeling. That's not a feeling. That's not a feeling. A feeling is I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm sad, I'm angry. Those okay. are feelings. Okay. But I have to be a perfectionist is not a feeling. What is it? A belief. It's a, a belief, right? A wrong belief. It's a, it's a, well, it's a belief. Wrong or right, it's a belief. Okay. And you probably understand by now that the belief is what you adopted, adapted, if you will, in order to survive your childhood. So that every time the question of, I have to be perfect, comes up for you, you're going to have to be conscious of it. And ask yourself, OK, I have this belief that I have to be perfect. Is that really true? Or is that still just my childhood? And then, and what is the impact? Uh, I really, hello, I really w wanted to talk to you. So that's okay for you to leave. If you need to do that, that's fine. You actually have a right. I got it, yeah. So my request is that you send me an email. Sure. Okay? You. You're welcome. What's your name? Natalia. Natalia, okay, I'd, like to, I'd just like to speak with you sometime. Okay, so um, you can get my information from Clara. Yeah, thank you. I, I might be able to say that. Let me, I have a right word. Well, that's fine. So whatever, whatever works. Okay, I just wanted to complete our conversation. That's all. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
So you're gonna have to ask yourself, uh, recognize, okay, I got this belief that I'd be perfect right now. Is that really true? Or is it just my own childhood stuff showing up? And then you have a decision to make. So it's gonna be practice for you. Practice. Just notice it every time it comes up for you. There's no big how. It's not gonna go away right away. It's wired in your brain very deeply. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna keep coming up. You might even go home after this workshop and you're gonna ask you, say to yourself, oh geez, I should have asked something different. It's right. happening right now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, so notice it. Just notice it. Just notice it, allow it to be there, but decide for yourself whether you wanna to continue to feed that belief or not. Okay? You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah? Hi. Um, yeah, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you were talking early about um, what the meaning of having a disease in our life mm -hmm. is. And one of the things you touched upon was um, how our grandparents were living their lives. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. First of all, in a study of mice recently, it was shown that when the grandfather is stressed, the stress is passed on through the sperm to the grandchild so that it's passed on epigenetically. Certain biological mechanisms will happen that the grandchild will inherit. That's one way that it's passed on. The second way that it's passed on, of course, is that if my grandfather was um, a very angry man who threatened his children, then my mother will grow up very fearful, especially of anger. So then when I'm one and a half year old and I get angry because I can't have a cookie before dinner, she's threatened by that. And she will then get very sad or upset or withdraw emotionally from me when I'm angry. Then I learn to suppress my anger. So this is how the grandfather stuff was passed on to me. And of course, the grandfather's anger was caused by stuff that happened in his childhood. And that's why it says in the Bible that the sins of the fathers are passed on through the generations. Does that clarify? Okay, thank you. Um, hands. Um, Claire, can I ask you a question? Do you work a lot with projectors and, and movies and so on? Um, not so much. I just wondering because the, the way you move through the room is like this. <laughs> Why do you do that? Just so that I'm not blocking people's vision. Okay. <laughs> What's well, very kind, but I would suggest it's highly unnecessary. Okay. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Nothing's happening when you're walking with the mic. All that's happening is you're walking with the mic. I'm not saying anything. Nobody's doing anything. So just another, you're taking too much responsibility here at the expense of your back, by the way. Okay? Yeah. I've got a question. Yes. A, a person that is very close to me has just been diagnosed with MS, yeah. very young person. Right. And the decision right now is um, should she or should she not start doing the injections that people oftentimes right. do when they have MS. Right. Um, she feels great. She really doesn't want to do the injections, but the medical community is so intent on telling her she must or else. Her neurologist, okay, you must do this or else. What is the else? Or you know, if your lesion had been a quarter of an inch to the right, you would have been paralyzed. Mm -hmm. These lesions can grow. You must, you must prevent a second episode from occurring. Yeah, yeah. And, and are they guaranteeing that the injections will prevent a second episode? That's right. They're guaranteeing that. Her neurologist said, my job is to make sure that you do not have a second episode. Therefore. Yeah, but 
can they scientifically guarantee that if they do the injections, she will not have any more? No, he can't do that. No, of course they can't. So the decision, the, the question is, um, should she start these injections or not? I, right. Okay. It's it's really hard because the medical community doesn't really seem to want to go there. Yeah, fair enough. And Absol address the absolutely issue. not. Absolutely not. And. Um, it's a very difficult situation, and I, I'm very really loath to give advice to somebody I don't know, uh, who I can't talk with personally. But, but here, as best I can approach an answer, here's what it is. If I was talking with your friend or this person in your life, and I clearly got the sense that she, they did not want to do this, I'd say go with what they, what they want. Go with your authentic self here. There's something in you guiding you in a different direction. And I'd take the risk, and I'd say to her, look, there's a risk here. But if in you, you're willing to accept that, then do it. Secondly, the doctors don't necessarily, they don't know much about this. They know what they know. They don't see the larger picture. So they can only speak from fear. So if she's getting a fear-based response. Mm -hmm. Another response from the neurologist would have been, hmm, that's interesting. Why do you feel that way? No way. No, there's no way. Right, you know. So there's no room for her to be her in this relationship. Right. Exactly. That's okay. very true. Yeah. So then, what I can also tell you, and this is not, I don't want to hold any kind of a promise here, but I've been told by more than a few people with MS that this book saved their lives. Really? Okay. Really. Okay. The second chapter is on MS. And, and what they mean by that is the, no, a book can't save anybody's life. What they mean by it really, and they're just projecting their own process onto the book. But what, what they're really saying is that given what they learned in the book about themselves, what they recognize about themselves, they start to live life differently. And that meant they, kept, they said no to people that they wanted to say no to. It also meant they became active in their own lives rather than being passive recipients. Mm -hmm. It also meant taking a really deep emotional inventory doing physical work, doing emotional work, spiritual work, whatever it took, that they, they for the first time, now your friend, if they have MS, I can tell you that they fit every pattern I've been talking about the whole day. Okay? If she reads this book and recognizes herself in it, then I would say to her is, the doctors are telling you that the MS has a life of its own. And I would say to you, the MS does not have a life of its own. The MS reflects your life. And if you live your life differently, if you learn how to say no and to really assert yourself, then maybe your body, more than, more than likely your body will not have a, won't have a need to say no anymore. And the flare-ups when they happen, always happen in response to stress. And that's not my particular opinion, it's also what the research shows. It's just that certain kind of research does not penetrate into the medical mind. And I could talk the whole day about that. So I would very much encourage your friend to, to really explore her feelings, to be true to herself, to explore other avenues, certainly to read this book, and, and to go that route. That's what I would, now I'd have to talk to your friend uh, to be really sure about my advice, but that's, where, that's what comes up for me, okay? Thank you so much. You're welcome. However, you can't be the one to talk her into that. I mean, it has to come from within her. Okay? Right. Okay? Hi. So, um, I guess kind of stemming off from that, I feel like with the whole saying no thing and everything, it's just so complicated navigating the medical system and trying to have a voice for your own health in doctor's offices and things like, um, I have fibromyalgia and it's just like a continuous suggestion of medicines that don't necessarily make me feel any different or do make me feel worse. Um, and they just kind of are like, stay on it, stay on it. Okay. What have you got from the conversation today? Um, that I need to express myself more. <laughs> Keep going. Or say no more. Keep going or be honest more, or? What do you feel when you're saying that right now? I feel really nervous and like I might cry. Right. And what is that about? 
that I'm just um, really uncomfortable. I don't know. Well, look at that. Where's that discovered in your body right now? I mean, in all my muscles, they're all just really tight. Yeah. Okay. Well, look. Um, what you're saying is true. But most physicians, they don't know what to make of this. They do what they know. So what they know is pharmacology. They know that if they give you 10 milligrams of amitriptyline three times a day, or nortriptyline three times a day, you might have some easing of your symptoms. But how to, how to understand your illness in a larger context of your life, they don't have a clue about. They're not taught that way. They're not oriented that way. So it's not surprising that you don't hear a whole lot of welcoming for any questioning of, of, of that perspective, that you don't hear any kind of support for your attempts to do it differently. Well, my suggestion is you go to the doctors for what they can do, but don't go to them for what they can't do. Okay. They're not the only game in town. Right. You know, there are naturopaths, there's osteopaths, there are traditional Chinese medicine therapists, there's psychotherapists, there's spiritual work to be done, there's above all your work to be done, such as I've been indicating today. And go to the doctors when you want something from them that they can do. But don't go to them for stuff that they can't do. They're not your parents. You don't have to convince them that your perspective is right. Uh, you don't have to be upset that they don't understand you. They don't understand you because they don't understand themselves. They don't understand you because this perspective is foreign to them. What would be more natural than that they wouldn't understand you? not personal to you, but you're not reliant upon them. Not like you were as a kid, reliant on your parents. You can find your own way, which you couldn't do then. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Hi, I read your book in the realm of hungry ghosts and it's amazing. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I think the way that it's impacted me not saying no in my life, and I'm a psychotherapist as, as well, I didn't go to the school though, but you know, I think um, I got sick. When I was 25, I, was, I came down with a hyperthyroid. Mm -hmm. And then uh, three years later, endometriosis. Right. And it seemed like you would think that would be kind of my rock bottom for my codependency issues and my inability to say no. <laughs> But it wasn't. So it wasn't until I faced um, someone else's addiction that I was actually brought to Al-Anon. And Al-Anon is what really helped me to figure out what it is that, who I was and what I was feeling and why I was such a people pleaser and why right. I had no voice. Right. But it's still just continuous work. And I have just recently went to a homeopathic doctor for okay. the same kind of frustrations that pe other people here have mentioned. And it's a much more holistic view. It's what I'm eating, what I'm doing, how I'm exercising, how I'm treating right. myself, and this expression that you speak of. Right. So um, everybody has their different rock bottoms, the w is how I see it. They do, but that depends on our perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay? Let me quote you from Almas again. He says, your conflicts, all the difficult things, the problematic situations in your life are not chance of haphazard or ch of haphazard. They're specifically yours, designed specifically for you by a part of you that loves you more than anything else. The part of you that loves you more than anything else has created roadblocks to lead you to yourself. You're not going to go in the right direction unless there's something pricking you in the side telling you, look here, this is way. That part of you loves you so much that it doesn't want you to lose the chance. It will go to extreme measures to wake you up. It will make you suffer greatly if you don't listen. What else can it do? That's its purpose. So in your case, the party that loves you so much said, so this person is not getting it. Let's make her hyperthyroid. <laughs> and then you, you got hyperthyroid, you got treated for that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you still didn't get it. Because nobody led you 
you didn't understand and nobody led you to understand that there's a teaching here for you. So then the part that loves you more than anything else says, okay, let's give her endometriosis. Let's give her some pain in her pelvic area. <laughs> and you still didn't get it. Nope. So the part that loves you more than anything else says, okay, great. Let's hook her up with an addict. <laughs> now maybe she'll get it. And you did. I did. Yeah. Now, so rock bottom is nothing outside of ourselves. Rock bottom is whatever happens to make us get it. And if we stubbornly don't get it, we're going to keep hitting more and more rock bottoms. But perhaps had you had a bit more consciousness, or perhaps had you talked to anybody with a bit more consciousness, that rock bottom might have been the thyroid. Right. Or even something before that. Less severe. Okay? Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Great, you stood up. <laughs> <laughs> she stood up for herself. Do you... Questions? I, I'll, I'm going to stay another 10 minutes. So another question is, yeah? Okay, over there first. Yes, hi. Um, I think that what you've shared so far shows that it is about the consciousness and responsibility that you bring to whatever practice you bring. But um, I wanted to ask about what um, types of work you think are, um, like most allow this type of consciousness that you're talking about to make its way in the world because you've talked about you know conscious or unconscious medical community or even a therapeutic community um, so I think it's perhaps more what you bring to it but what type of work would you say is most kind of in tune with this type of uh, consciousness yeah. okay well thanks for the question I don't know that I have that, that kind of an answer I know that um, there are many kinds of work out there and people have to find their own particular path I personally, uh, I'm still doing with somebody else. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm the recipient of this work, if you like. Holotropic breath work, for example, which is, does not involve taking any substances, but it does alter your consciousness. You get very deep with yourself, holotropic breath work. There's, of course, spiritual work of all kinds, meditation, mindfulness, vipassana, 10, 10 days of silence. There's the work of Almas and his diamond, uh, diamond uh, approach. Um, there's Eckhart Tolle and his wonderful teachings in his books and seminars. There's here in California, I think Adyashanti, who's a great spiritual teacher. Um, there's the work of Dan Siegel at UCLA on brain development and consciousness. There's my work. Um, it, you're gonna, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't make one particular. There's the ayahuasca work that I've engaged with, very powerful. Um, but there's no, there's no one size fits all. And it all comes down to, in the end, it all comes down to whatever you can do to elevate your level of consciousness or awareness and your ability to accept and be with whatever is arising. Were you going to say something else? I, well, I was going to say that it seems like you can do any of those things and still be leading yourself down the path of still lying to yourself in some ways. Yes, of course. <laughs> so what? <laughs> you want to be perfect? I just want to get you, closer. You want the magic pill. I don't want to be walking in the wrong direction. <laughs> well, you're going to have to keep checking in with yourself. There's a guide in you that will tell you. Okay? You can't figure it out here. You can't figure it out up here. You can't. Uh, I have a question about mental illnesses and mental issues. We've talked about a lot of like physical diseases sure. leading to like you know a disconnect between the body and the mind. Sure. But like, are different mental issues indicators to different things that are going on wrong and put our lives? Like, you know, what is anxiety trying to tell me? Like, what is depression? Are they like different, or do they point to the same underlying problem? Yes, they do. Um, remember that quote that I read you. Um, let me see if I can find it again, just to read it again. <clears throat> Go 
growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity stress can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. So mental illnesses, just like the physical illnesses show up as a result of adaptations, mm -hmm. so do the mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. So let's look at depression. How can depression be an adaptation? Well, we already said that depression means pushing down. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said earlier, if my mother can't handle my anger when I'm a year and a half and I can't have that second cookie before dinner, and I'm going to be angry and she's going to be threatened, then in order to maintain the relationship with her, mm -hmm. I'm going to depress my anger. And 10, 20 years later, 30 years later, I'm diagnosed with depression. Hmm. Okay? Uh, ADHD, um, which I've been diagnosed with, by the way. <laughs> well, tuning out, that's my first book. American title is Scattered. And what is that? Uh, tuning out is not a disease. This is not a disease like the doctors say it is. What it actually is, it's a coping mechanism. Mm. Why would a person tune out? Because the stress is too much. And if the, pe and the person is tuning out when the brain is developing in the first few years, mm. which is when it does, then the tuning out becomes programmed into the brain. It's a coping mechanism that later on creates problems in learning. What are okay, the reasons no, for anxiety? Anxiety. Anxiety, as my friend Gordon Neufeld, co-writer in my book, Hold On To Your Kids, says, anxiety is an attachment alarm. So that attachment is a need to connect to somebody, to be close, uh -huh. in order to be taken care of as children or as adults, to take care of children. Mm -hmm. So attachment is that drive for closeness, proximity, <coughs> emotionally and physically. When the attachment is not available or it's not working, <laughs> anxiety goes up like an alarm so that the kid can scream for help. Oh. And that's why babies cry at night, and that's why it's so terrible not to pick up babies who cry. Okay? Now later on, if that baby is not picked up or the attachment relationship is somehow continually um, being disrupted because of stuff on the part of the parents, the anxiety becomes embedded. So what, becomes, uh, what begins as a coping mechanism ends up being what we call a disease. And ultimately the solution, of course, is it doesn't matter if you're 35 years old and all of a sudden you reconnect with your parent, it's still not going to help you because who you really have to reconnect with self, it, reconnect mm -hmm. with is yourself. Now, as a child you couldn't do that, as an adult you can. But it did begin as a coping mechanism. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. And that's the last question I can take. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.